And I look to the left, and it's Michael Caine. He's in the same car, but it was yellow. And I went, good morning, Michael. And he looked at me, and I went, not bad for the Scouser, is he? <laughs> <laughs> and he told me it was um, a, um, a TSB that was delivering a large amount of money. So we parked the van across the street. We all got tooled up. We got our masks on, and we waited by the bus stop. These police cars are coming down. They've got the lights flashing, there, 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 there. Next thing, Joey said, they're turning around. They're coming after us. Big heavy gangsters that I knew, and um, we'd had a Chicago warfare in the 70s in Liverpool. He had a big reputation. He went on to have a bigger reputation when he was, you know, in, on, the, on the importation. And he was very well respected in Liverpool. But I didn't respect him. After this, I thought, no, you're, you're going to get it, mate. George Harrison lived next door to him. On the other side was Barbara Streisand. Down the street was Gregory Peck. Rod Stewart. Frank Sinatra. At the bottom was Elvis. And facing Elvis was Michael Jackson. On this side of my brain, it was beautiful. But on the other side of the brain, it was dark. I was on the run. All right, we are in part two of this epic journey with Terry Mugan, who's flown over from California. Check out part one if you've not seen it. It's the early years, upbringing, in an abusive cur home situation, then gets into the street gang level of stuff and quickly getting professional and proficient at armed robberies. So the crimes are escalating rapidly and we left off with... Uh, we were just about to talk about the surveillance by the Serious Crime Squad, but you had a story about Joey. Joey, yeah. Uh, yes. Joey. So eventually, after that was acquitted, Joey was my partner, and he'd asked me to, there was two other guys from the city of Liverpool in, that lived in the city centre. So Joey had asked me, he said, can we bring these other two guys and they've got a job for us to do? And he said, go and get Terry. And I went, okay, I'll take a look. But I'd, I'd heard of them, these two lads, and they were notorious, but no, they'd never been caught. And they were pretty tough lads. So I decided I'd meet them and the they knew everyone that I knew. And so they approached me and they said, um, there's a, a van coming th th um, through the city. And said, did you fancy having it? So I said, whereabouts is it? And they told me it was um, a, um, a TSB that was delivering a large amount of money. So I asked them the situation and they said, there's quite a bit of money in there. We've had the surveillance on it. We've had people go into the bank, a few of our friends, and it's quite sufficient money. I said, yeah, okay. And I'll, yeah, I'll have a go. So next thing, I didn't know I was under surveillance. And Joey was quite a bit of a tough kid. And these two fellas were pretty good. So I said, well, who's going to take him? That was the plan. So there was a bus stop on Scotland Road by the TSB. We have the safe house off Westminster Road set up. Then we have another house up in Anfield set up by a friend, my friend's house because I could trust him. I knew, I knew what I was going to do. So we parked the van across the street. We all got tooled up. We got our masks on, and we waited by the bus stop. It was about 1.30, and it was one of the guys' jobs to jump on the guard, take him. Then I had, a, I had a special way of getting the box off them. If you get them down, it's called a one, two, three, pin, pin down move where you get them on the floor and then the arm was, the foot would go on the arm here and would squash the muscle and then they'd release the box here in the hand. That was my pin down move. <laughs> so I said, you get them down. I said, and I'll do the pin down on them. Anyway, we're waiting there, we're anxious and we've got these big, it's in October. 
and it's a cold day. So it was a good opportunity to get nice and covered up. We were tooled up to pieces. If anything went wrong, we were just going to... Uh, basically, our job was not to hurt anybody. That was our motive. But our motive was just to get the money and we'll do one. So Joey had just been in jail. He'd just been, just done three years for something. I can't remember what it was. It could have been a robbery. And, and then he was back at it. So that's the way we were. So Joey, and come on, okay, Terry. So we parked across Scotland Road in the flats, put the van there, and we had this house in Anfield to go to. Next thing, Joey comes over. We're at the bus stop. Joey's down the side. We mates at the bus stop. Soon the van comes, the security van comes, secure the car. We waited for them to get out, and then what they do, they knock on, they give it a knock for him to release the box inside. So they knocked on, my friend just jumped on him, I ran at him, locked him down, done the pin down move on him. Within, I think it was about two, in his statement, he said, um, he had the box off me in three seconds. He's actually got it off me. That was in his statement. We ran across Scotland Road into the van. I was the only one that got in the van. I didn't know what the other two were doing. They just done one. They got away. So I'm in the van. Joey's driving the van. And I've got the box. Next thing. We're going through Scotland Road. Up Vauxhall Road, and then we, we cut into Anfield. And as we're going up this hill called Everton Valley, these police cars are coming down. They've got the lights flashing. There, 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 there. Next thing, Joey said, they're turning around. They're coming after us. And I went, what? He said, yeah. They're on our sale, Teddy. And I went, just keep going, Joey, to the house. Just keep going there. So next thing, Joey hits a car. It's a car, smashes into a car. He's panicking. Boom, I said, just keep going. When we get to the house, just get out and do one, okay? So next thing, we get to this um, house called Randolph Street in Anfield, and Joey jumps out. I jumped out. All the bit, all the coppers are behind us. And there must have been about 10 of them. All the pandas are behind us. So we, we run through this house, runs through an entry. I've got the box. I get to, Joey gets lost. I go to another house, to the safe house, to my friend's house, locks the door, takes the box upstairs, and it's the six flats in there, so I hide in the top flat. Get the box and I put it under the bed. Next thing, we're surrounded. I can't get out. The police just come in, they smash the door down, eventually got up to the, the top floor of the flat, kicked it in, came in, grabbed me, they got me. I was, I was in there alone because my friend wasn't home. They got me, put the cuffs on me, and they started battering me, kicking up me, and come on, we fucking got you now. Next thing, they takes me down, gets me in the Black Mariah, boom, straight to St. Anne's Street. Can I ask a quick question? How did they go straight to you? Is there a trace or something in the box? No. How just, did you know to go to exactly where you was? Well, because they'd followed us, okay. because I was running. Yeah. And they knew that I'd, I'd gone to that house. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they knew that I was in okay. the house. They were right behind me. There yeah. was about fucking 20. There was no hiding. Yeah, there was no hiding this time. Yeah. Couldn't get out of it. So next thing they get me, next thing all the serious crime squads from the city come. Ah, uh, they've got me now. So next thing, we're in this, we're in this cell. And I hear Joey next door. I hear Joey. And he's going, Teddy, are you in there? And I went, yeah, no lies. He said, have you been charged? I went, yeah. He said, we're going to the magistrates in the morning. I said, have you been charged? He went, yeah. Anyway, they charged us with um, robbery, with force. And in the van, they found all the tools. They found an hatchet. They found, um, it was like a small handgun. And then they found a, um, a pickaxe handle. And they found a hammer. So they had all the evidence. So anyway, early hours in the morning, we're getting, we got took to the um, city centre, the Bridewell, and it was the most, I thought, oh, I've had it now. You know, my time's, I'm done. They've got me banged to rights. And Joey's like, 
tell you, you know, I've just done two years in jail, you know, was, you know, we might get 10 years. So anyway, we go to the magistrates, straight away custody, gets put in custody. They've got us now. Anyway, we go to my old lawns, goes to Risley, gets in Risley, and gets banged up together, me and Joey. So we're doing our just thing, just carrying on slowly. So one day, I thought it was very unusual. Joey got a visit. And they called me and said, um, Joey, rise. And he gets this visit. And he goes out. And I'm just sitting on my own. I thought, I wonder what's going on here? He's got a visit. You know, it's not visiting time. <sighs> it was a bit odd. So when he came back, and then in the afternoon we're on the exercise yard, and he said to me, I've just had a visit. I said, I know, yeah, who's that? Who's, who's you had a visit off? He said it was um, a couple of the top serious crime squad from St. Anne Street. I said, yeah. And he said, um, I've got them boxed off. I've got it sorted. He said, I've, he said, I'm, I'm, he said I'm giving them 5,000 quid. He said, and we're going to get out. And I went, what? I said, no, it's impossible. I said, they've been after me for years, Joey. They're not going to let me out. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going, really? He went, yeah. He said, I said, no fucking way, lad. They're not going to let me out. He said, no, Terry, we're going to get out. And I started asking questions and I didn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it either. And no. I think no. I just take the money and run. Yeah. So anyway, what happened is um, the detective, he used to do surveillance on me when I was out on bail for the um, the post office van, I had 24 hour surveillance and his name was Smith. And that's where I used that name for the woman in the trial. It was the same police officer. I used his name. That's how I, I, I knew it was him. So next thing, we go to the, the magistrates and they bring us up. And uh, the magistrate was Wharton. He was a horrible bastard. He was just, he, he just put you in custody. You couldn't get out, even with kids for shoplifting. And me and Joey goes up, goes in there. And um, he was a bit hunched over, but he had like a funny back. He must have had arthritis or scoliosis in his back. The way he, he, he leans over in the court. And he looked and he had these glasses and he spoke out the side of his mouth. He went, and are these the two robbers that did the robbery? <laughs> and Mugen, he's been, he's been in front of me before. I know him. And, <laughs> and I'm going, fuck you, you old bastard, yeah. <laughs> and so what's the situation? Where's the police officers in this case? This is a very serious crime. And where are they? And the prosecution said, um, they're not here to oppose the bail, you know. What am I supposed to do? He stuck the magistrate. He doesn't know what to do. And it was causing mayhem in the court. <laughs> and Joey's <laughs> looking at me. I thought, fucking hell, what's he going to do here? We're going to get out here. <laughs> so next thing, next thing, he comes to a decision and he says, okay, you must call the police station and tell them I'm, I'm, I'm postponing this till two o'clock this afternoon. Um, put them back in custody. I can't let them out. I can't let them go. I need the police here. And uh, so next thing, we go downstairs, me and Joey. And next thing, Joey says, don't worry, Terry. I said, what happens if they show up? I said, they might fucking show up. And he goes, no, they're not going to show up. He said, they've took an holiday, two weeks holiday. No. <laughs> yeah. He said, they took two weeks. They took two weeks holiday. So next thing. He goes up at two o'clock, there's still no fucking serious crime squad. So the magistrate says, Oh, but I, I, I have no choice, I've got to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So, we said, so me and Joey have just done one of the biggest robberies on Scotland Road, and the magistrate is letting us go because of the cops. Joey's got the cops. And Joey's got the cops all boxed off. But then, wow. so we walked out the court walks out the court my wife was there and Joey's wife was there they didn't know each other and um, but he was with two gangsters Joey big heavy gangsters that I knew and um, we'd had a Chicago warfare in the 70s in Liverpool and I knew a lot of them 
on the bouncers on the doors and that you know but I, I just said hello to them and never ever got involved with any of them but there was two of them showed up when joey got out and they knew me and uh, they went all right terry and i said yeah all right how are you and he said and i just looked at them and i went what are you doing with him and i thought this is a bit heavy in it and i said to joey um where are you going he went, i'm just going down here and what he had, he'd had a plan that he was going into the Bridewell to meet Smith to make a statement. He'd gone into the Bridewell with these two guys. They were his minders. And um, I said to him, hey, mate, be fucking careful what you're doing, you know. I'm telling you, I just sensed it. I knew what he was up to. So next thing, he goes in the Bridewell, he makes a statement. He said that he had nothing to do with the robbery and it was me. Oh, man. And he said that he'd lent me the van. But he didn't name the other two fellas, only me. So that would put him off the hook. So next thing, at the committal, I got the, the depositions and I read them. And it was all in there. So I kept it quiet. How did that feel though, reading that initially? Yeah, and the betrayal. Well, obviously we're gonna he's gonna he's gonna suffer. We're gonna take him serious consequences against him. And later on his life would be the there would be a contract on his life to kill him. Did you feel though like just so let down and it was an emotion? Well, yeah. Well, you you know, you realised he had a, a, a big reputation. He had a big reputation. He went on to have a bigger reputation when he was you know, in, on the on the importation, and he was very well respected in Liverpool. But I didn't respect him. After this, I thought, no, you're you're going to get it, mate. We're going to get you. You know, we are going to get you. So anyway, what we did, there was another plan in the city centre for the same four guys to hijack a security van next to Water Street. It was a place called Williamson Williamson Square. And it was a bank that we'd watched and they were carrying a large amount of money for, and that money would be delivered to all the, the building sites in Liverpool. So we planned it like for three months, about two months, three months. And we had the plan out to get away where we we're going to go. But in between that, we'd been training, we'd been going to Formby beach and we'd do like really physical training, like, fighting with each other, putting each other on the floor, running up and down the sand dunes, doing five to eight miles a day, really getting really fit if if there was ever something would go wrong in one of these jobs. That's what we always did. And then we'd always go to the boxing gyms in Liverpool and we'd always do heavy training, you know. So this day, I'm on the bail and I'd lost it. I'd, I'd just actually lost my mind. Because we'd lost that money. And I thought, well, we'll make it up on the next one. So this morning was set. And it was nine o'clock in the morning. The security security call van would arrive at Williams Square. But he had to park outside Williamson Square. So we're tooled up. Everything. We would meet at 8.45. But this time there was no cars involved because we could run through the city. We know the back entries of the city and where we're going to go. So we decided, okay, we'd all meet at 8.45 and it was at, um, it was at a Bernie's Inn, a restaurant, and it was in a cellar and we got tooled up, put the mask on and we were ready. The van came, he goes in the bank, but however, there was only three of us. Joey never showed up. He doesn't show up. The other two guys show up. I show up to some of three of us. So I, you know, we didn't think nothing of it at the time. We thought, well, you know, there's three of us. We can take him. So I told my buddy, I said, you go behind him and I want you to stop him in front of the van so that he can't put the box in the van. Then I'll come down behind him. I'll do the pin move on him. I'll just get him down with a, a, a headlock, a one, two, three, bang. I've got him. I've got the box. And then we run through an alleyway and then we close the door behind us and we lock it. However, bump. Next thing, as we're doing the robbery, 
from both ends of Dale Street as you come around Dale Street by the wine lodge in Liverpool. Two, two pandas come around and then they block the other end of the street off and they've got the, the street blocked off and they're coming behind the security van as we're doing it. We were set up. So anyway, I had the box and one of the coppers is chasing me. So I go right through the city and um, there's a Lloyds Bank and a, a new Lloyds Bank. So I took a car park, I got up at the stairs in the car park and I, I laid under the car with the box and I was just watching for any footsteps. I was well ahead of the busy. We were well ahead of them because we were so physically fit. So next thing, I left the box under the car. I thought, I can't take it. And then there was a large, I think it was about probably £90,000 in it. And I thought, well, I don't want to carry this through the city. We had no cars. It was a different, totally different situation. So I thought, well, if I leave this here. But then my mind was panicking, thinking the city was swarming. But outside Lord's Bank, there was a bus stop. And it was the 17D going to Anfield, past Liverpool's ground. And I thought, I'll, I'll just leave it here, under the car. And I went, fuck it, I give in. I'd actually give in, I just, I just left it. Goes down. I took my balaclava off, I dumped it. I took my tools off, I dumped them. Next thing, I took the 17T bus. Went to my mother's house and had a cup of tea with my brother. He said, where have you been? Oh, I said, I've just been to town. What's wrong with you? I said, oh, something went wrong. My brother wouldn't say nothing. He's one of them guys, you know. So next thing, that was it. That was the end of it. Next morning, I thought, just, I was laying in bed. Laying in bed. Wife's asleep. Can't go farm. I had this lovely place. And all the gangsters had been there. They had parties and that. And, and it was like quiet. And I had it like a penthouse. You know, from the money we'd made and I had brand new cars and Cortinas and we had, you know, we'd had, we'd done well. So next thing, about six o'clock in the morning, bump, the door just comes right off the hinges. Bump, about six of them come in. I'm in bed and I've got the shock of my life. Copper puts a gun to my head and he says, get out of fucking bed. You're under arrest. And I went, get that gun away from me, mate. Fuck off. Because that's how, you know, I was crazy at the time. I said, get that gun out of my face. I said, no, get the fuck out of it. Get up. They got me, they pinned me on the floor. My wife screaming. And I went, oh, they've got me here. So next thing, they take me in. They search the house. There's nothing in the house. They tear the house apart. Kitchen everywhere, looking for money and everything. Never, ever found anything. So what happened was, they take me into St. Anne Street and I'm under the surveillance of getting questioned and they're asking me, well, you're involved in this, you're involved in that. And they said, um, we're going to get you on um, quite a few robberies. It'd be approximately four of them. They said, you hijacked a security van outside the gyro with pickaxe handles and you escaped with £73,000. And um, I looked at the file. As I was sitting there, this cop came in from the serious crime squad, and I, had me, I seen the file, and I looked over at it, and it said, Operation Transit, Terry Mugan. And as I looked at it, I went, hmm, I wonder what they've got here. So I just usually, you know, we used our, our skills from when we were a kid. We just... Absolutely stayed silent. So I'm in, I'm in the police station. It goes on for about 12 hours. And I'm in my underwear and I've got a blanket around me. And there's just no food, no solicitors, no nothing. I thought. So the copper says to me, I tell you what, why don't you admit to one of them? He said, I tell you what, if you admit to the gyro and bootle, We'll let you off with the other three. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going under my breath, fuck off. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Who the fuck are you talking to? 
And uh, I just felt like saying, you know, you're talking to one of the fucking safest men in Liverpool that will never say a fucking word, mate. I've never said a word in my life. So what he said to me, he said, we, we want to get you for attempted murder on the Moss Lane post office that you were found not guilty on for attacking him with a hammer. That man got seriously injured. And next, I got the shock of my life. He said, we've got your friend, John Lee. He was pulled in for the bootle job on the gyro and the 73,000. He said he's admitted to doing the one in Sefton. Was where he's he, making where, that up? Yeah, or had he course. really done no, it? No, no, they got him. They got him. And so he got pulled in. He actually got pulled in on the job for bootle on the gyro for 73,000. <laughs> they thought it was me and they thought it was him because I was connected with him with the one in, in um, Sefton where he'd punched the guy through the window and they actually said to him we're not letting you out so John we're going to get you and he admitted to punching the guy through the window and he gets charged <sighs> so they said to me Teddy if you come up with this we'll let you go you admit with John Lee that you'd planned the Moss Lane Post office, hijacking. And I just looked at them under my breath and I used myself to talk and went, fuck off. You're fucking joking, aren't you? So next thing, anyway, I'm in there. 12 hours had gone by, no solicitor. They wouldn't give me a solicitor. 12 hours had gone by. But this big CID walked and he kicked the door. He went, get him up. Get him up. Take him to the front of the sergeant. So they go to the front, there's, there's about six of them. And uh, they'd been there all day. They kept asking me, I just wasn't having none of it for many of them. Next thing, Sergeant go, what's, what's going on here? Um, he'll be charged with four robberies. And he goes like that. Looks at the, the CID and he goes, his name is Walker and Bailey. And he went, well, there could be a problem. I'm just waiting for the court. There's going to be a prison strike. We can't take any prisoners. And I'm going, wow. And I'm standing there in my undies with the big handcuffs on. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, come on. I hope there's a prison strike. And they, and they can't take me. And I said, ah, nah, they'll take me. They're gonna do. They, there's no way in the world they're gonna let me go. Next thing, the sergeant says, um, "Take him back in." No one waits fifteen minutes. And I was on my own. They must have been talking to the sergeant, and I heard them say, "They cannot let this man go." So next thing, they come in back to me and they said to me, "Okay, you're going to be charged with four robberies." Um, if you come clean, Teddy, you'll go. You'll probably get fifteen years. If you get you on the four year, if if you get you on the four robberies, and I knew the four robberies, what they were talking about, I knew who done them, who was involved, and I was part of some of it. And they said to me, probably the judge will give you twenty five years. You get twenty five years. So I'm standing there, thought, fuck this, I'm saying nothing. I'll take a fucking a chance. I've never ever since I was a kid when I stole from the milkman, I never ever admitted anything in my life. And I'm, I wasn't about to start it now, even though I'd gone into the big time. And so they called me back out and um, the sergeant said to me, um, Mugen, I want you to come back here tomorrow. And I looked at him and I went, we're giving you 24 hours bail. And I just looked at him and I went, okay. And I had the cuffs like that and it, the cuffs were on me. And I just turned like that and I went to that, that to the detective. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, can you, can you take the cuffs off me? And they all started shouting at the sergeant. We, no, you can't release him. You've got, to, you've got to get someone in power. This man's got to stay here. And the sergeant, I've told you, we've just had orders from the government we cannot take any prisoners. There's going to be a strike. 
So anyway, they took the cuffs off me and it was killing them because they'd been after me for years. So it was going to get blown again. So I just thought, oh my God, this is the great escape. This is the great escape. So next thing I'm sitting there and they got a shirt and a pair of pants and they said, here, put them on. I said, all right, thanks very much. And I was in the city centre on um, St. Anne Street. And they said, okay, make sure you come back tomorrow. <laughs> so I walked down and I just fucking walked out. And I went, I smelled the fresh air. It was a, a cool night. Mm. It was a cool night. It was actually, um, what, what month was it? It was, um, it was December. It was December. And I thought, I'll, I'll shoot up Scotland Road. And I knew everyone there. So I went to this guy's house called um, Jimmy London. I went to his house and I said to him, Jimmy, where does Tommy Gilday live? Because Tommy was a, f- a friend of mine. He'd been arrested for um, assaulting a police officer. And I got to know him well in Risley. And I was in the same cell as him. And I got to know Tommy. He was an upcoming hard case. And I went to Tommy and I went to Tommy, do me a favour, mate. I said, um, can you come to Eighton tomorrow? To Cantrell Farm? I said, and pick me up, you and Jimmy. I said, and, um, I said, can you drive me to London? He said, yeah, all right, Terry. I said, I said, please be there at three o'clock in the morning. I'm going to leave at three. So Tommy drives me home to Cantrell Farm, knocks on the door. My wife opens it and she went, wow. I said, all right, everything okay? Yeah. So I thought, well, actually, they're going to surveil the house. They're watching me. They're watching every move I'd, I'd gone. So I said to my wife, pack me a bag. And I told Tommy to where to park the car in the tunnel so that if the coppers ever come through the tunnel, they couldn't get through it. I'm going to run through the tunnel. It was like a walkway. I said, park at the back of the tunnel and, you, and then flash your lights. I told my wife, she packed a bag. I said, go to your mother's house. I said, and get me 50,000 quid. I said, I want you to meet me tomorrow morning at Pan Am in London. She said, where are you going? I said, don't worry about it. Just do as I say. Get me the money. I've got a little bag. Be at Pan Am in the morning. Please. That's all I've got to say. So early hours in the morning, I looked out the window and I seen the car pulling up. So I got her open, I tied it to the window, to the handle, and I jumped right down from the first floor. I just jumped and I just kept running. And, and it was raining and the rain was coming down on it, it was freezing. And I had a mac on and that and a hut and a hat. Just jumped in the car. I went, all right, Tommy, go ahead, lad. Right up to London, him and Jimmy. And um, I drove to London. It was a, it was a, it was a, a, a very unusual... I, I actually, I, I didn't have a choice. It was either I was gonna, they were gonna get me, or I was gonna, I was gonna go down for a long time. And I, we drove to London, and I, I told them to take me to Pan Am Airlines, and they dropped me off. I said goodbye to Tommy and Jimmy, and um, I said I'll see you, I'll see you, mate. Thanks very much. And I, I walked in, and my wife was sitting there. And as we're sitting there, she went, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I'm sitting there in, in, uh, at the airport at Heathrow. And I said, I don't know where I'm going. So I looked at all the flights. I said, shall I go to Spain? I said, Australia. And, you know, I had a 10-year visa in my passport for America. And, then, and I'd met friends in Miami. I thought, shall I go to Miami? And then I got this thing came through my head when I was on the QE2 and Elizabeth Taylor had told me to go to Hollywood and she'd actually said to me when I was young, why don't you be an actor? You'd make a brilliant actor. I said, no, I'm not an actor. She went, Terry, even if you were a butler in Hollywood, she said they'd love you. And anyway, I looked at the flight and I went, ah, fuck it. I'll go to LA. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a ticket, a return ticket. And I said to my wife, I want you to sell everything. And I'd had a place in Southport. I'd bought, I'd got a custom caravan made. 
and it was it was the headquarters. It was at a, a park called Riverside, where we would all meet and plan everything, and no one knew about it. I said, and I just had a custom made, and I said, I want you to sell it and sell me cars. I said, get all the money, and I want you to fly out, quit your job. And I felt terrible for my wife, and it took me back to the days of like of um, Bigsy, Ronnie Biggs, what he had gone through, and I was feeling the same thing about Biggs. Because part of my life when I was young, I'd been on the run. And here I am now, really big, and I was going on the run. And I, I had this horrible feeling. So anyway, I said to my wife, I'll see you. And she went, where will you be? I said, well, I always remember Santa Monica. I'll go to Santa Monica. So anyway, I kissed her and I was, I was bored in the flight and I was sick as a dog. And I couldn't turn around. I was so emotional that it, 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 it had this grip on me that I'd, I was just, I was destroyed. But I thought, I've got to go. So I go, get on the plane. And um, I sat at the back of the plane. There was four seats. And they were coming around, giving me stuff and that. But I was actually, at the time I was sick. I started, the sickness started kicking in. I wasn't well from the emotions and there was certain things that was wrong with me from what I'd been doing throughout my life. It was catching up with me mentally. So, get off in Los Angeles, get off the plane. And in them days, it was like, it was like a bubble. And he just went through, went through the immigration, never asked any questions. And I came out and it was a lovely day. The sun was shining and it was lovely. So, I said to this fellow, where's the taxis, mate? So I jumped in the taxi, got the taxi. I said, take me to Santa Monica, will you? I said, is the hotel a motel? Or? He went, yeah, yeah, I'll take you. So he ends up in this motel called the Carmel Hotel on 2nd Street off Ocean Avenue. And it was a beautiful night and looking at the palm trees and all that. So I goes in this bar and it was um, called the Cheshire Cat. It was an English pub. And I went in and the girl looked at me and I looked at her and I went and said, um, do you sell British beers here? She went, oh yeah, yeah. I said, what have you got? She said, Newcastle Brown, we've got this, we've got that. I said, just give me Newcastle Brown. And she was nice like, and she went, where are you from? I said, Liverpool. She went, well, the chef, he's from Manchester. I'll go and tell him. So next thing the chef comes out and I said, all right, mate, how are you? I said, all right, how are you? I said, from Manchester, from Liverpool. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I've just got here for holiday. I'm on holiday. Oh, are you? Yeah. He said, there's a British bar up the street called the King George V. He said, there's a Liverpool fella in there. He's the chef. I said, all right. I said, I'll go up there later. So I was tired and all that, exhausted. Booked into the car motel. It was cheap. It was like In them days, it was like, it was like $15. Oh, and I had loads of money with me. I had 50,000 quid. You know, it was, good, it was a good chunk of change. And then, you know, what else was coming over as well? What my wife had had. And um, so I got my head down, slept. Next thing I thought, I'll take a walk up Fort Street, Santa Monica Boulevard, and seen the pub, two o'clock in the afternoon. Sunshine and beautiful. I was watching all the Cadillacs go by. In the day then, all the lovely, lovely Cadillacs and Mustangs and all the big Jaguars and it was beautiful. thought this is the life, you know. And I goes in the pub and I sat at the end of the bar and there was a Cockney behind the, the counter, John. He went, all right, mate, what do you want? And I said, um, have you got a pint of lager? Where are you fucking scarce, are you? I looked at him and went, yeah. He said, there's one in the kitchen here. He's a fucking pain in the ass." <laughs> and I went, really? <laughs> yeah. And he said, I'll go and have a word with him. So the guy comes out in the kitchen. He comes out and he goes, all right, mate. And he's staring at me. And he went, I know you. He went, I know you. And you, Terry? He said, I slept in your mother's house. He said, I'm a friend of Alan's. And I looked at him and he went, Eddie Creed. And I went, all right, Eddie, how are you, mate? And he went, what are you doing here? So anyway, I said, Eddie, can I talk to you? 
So I told Eddie what had happened because Eddie had been in Borstal and, you know, we so I could talk to somebody. I had no one to talk to. So eventually he said, I'll, I can get you the job here, you know. These Norwegians had just bought the pub, come from Norway and they, want, they paid like a quarter of a million for it. And he was saying to me, have you got any money? And I went, yeah, I'm fucking loaded. And he said, um, yeah. So I said, um, I'm, I'm staying now and that. And I said, you know, I'm on the run now. I've got to stay away. So we said, I can get you the job here. I said, we'll see what happens. So anyway, after about a week, I'd settled down and that. And I'd been in touch with my wife. Um, with a brother's house. He lived in down the East Lancashire Road. And I made the connection. She said she'd be over like in two months. So Eddie had took me back to this apartment on Fort Street in Santa Monica. And it was beautiful. And the guy was in in Scotland. Lovely apartment. I said, Eddie, let's get one of these. So anyway, I got an apartment. It was only like $300 a month at the time. Wow. Got the apartment. It was gorgeous. And it was about three blocks from the ocean. Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica. It was absolutely gorgeous. Eddie got me a job in the kitchen. And we became, I, I became the chef. And Eddie was the chef, and we did like about 16 hours, eight hours each. And we'd done the menu and everything. And anyway, about after two weeks, I'd met the owners and that they'd been back to Norway. They sold at home. And they, they come to me and asked me, they said, hey, do you want to be come as a silent partner in the pub? Um, $50,000. So I said, well, let me give it some thought. And Eddie said to me, do it, Terry, do it, become a silent partner. By this time, my brother, one of my brothers was coming over from Liverpool to see me already. He was coming from Liverpool, Tony, and um, he arrived, got him, and he come and stay with me in the apartment. I told him, he said, just do the investment, we'll, we'll keep it quiet, we won't tell anyone, we'll just think that, you know, that you're in the kitchen, you're the cook. So we'd done this deal. There was no lawyers involved. It was an handshake. And I would get 25% of the bar. And I was part owner in a pub. Next thing, me and Eddie were in charge of the pub. And, you know, you get some great characters come in. You know, some, some movie stars and that. So this guy's come in one day. And he's at the end of the bar and he's got a, he's got a, a trill beyond. And Eddie said to me, he said, that's Patrick McGowan. He said, he was the governor in Alcatraz. He said, um, and he'd done this big movie. And so we were cooking and fishing ships. And we'd serve him. And we'd go, hello, sir, how are you? And Patrick, right? Yeah, yeah. And he used to come in every day. And I'd talk to him, but we wouldn't invade his privacy. So I started getting a little bit sicker. Felt a bit sick. Like we very weak and I just knew there was something wrong with me so I was going to the bathroom and I was bleeding internally oh wow yeah started going to the bathroom and I had these pains in my stomach so I looked at some of the best hospitals in LA I didn't have any insurance I didn't have nothing and you know what it's like there so I went to this hospital and um, they advised me to go to get a private doctor. So there's a famous hospital called St. Joseph's in St. John's on 14th Street in Santa Monica. Very well renowned. So it goes in there, the hospital. And um, they said, oh, you've got to go across the street to see this doctor. His name is Dr. Messina, Alex Messina. So it goes across the street goes in and he looks at me, this young man. He said, hey, what's your problem? I said, I've got pains in my stomach. I said, I think I'm bleeding internally. So we said, okay, we're going to do these tests, the upper GI series and some tests. And then I'd formed um, psychological pains in the side of my head, really severe chronic pain. And I said, I'm getting these like seizures. Oh, we said, okay, then we're going to send you to an, um, a neurosurgeon in Beverly Hills at Senior Sinai Medical Center, Dr. Nelson. 
So they'd done the physical on me. They'd done some blood tests. I was I was weak on blood. I was I was anemic. When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Coro Snacks. Coro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. Oh, these Syrian pumpkin seeds from Coro are amazing. I have them on my cheese on toast every morning. You've been getting into them, Jen? Yes, and all the health benefits it brings. <laughs> Look at that. There's quite a lot. Quite a lot. I don't... Lashings of them. Right. Pop this in the oven then. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Coro cares about sustainability. Their bulk packs save on packaging material compared to small single packs. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. And then he's done a scan on the upper GI. I had three massive bleeding ulcers. And he said to me, we're going to have to take your stomach away if, if you don't seal them. So they sealed it with a drug called Corafit. And then I said, well, what about the pains? He said, I'm going to put you on a course of Valium to calm you down. And he said to me, he was Italian, Dr. Messina. And he said to me, why are you having so many problems? What is wrong with you? And I told him. I'd actually opened up and told the doctor my situation. He said, well, if that's the situation, I'm going to have to give you a referral to a forensic psychiatrist. So we're going to see Dr. Nelson, done two brain scans, one intravit on a drip, and then another brain scan. And they came back. They were fine. I was in the clear. I was happy. I actually thought that I had a tumour on the brain, but everything was good. So next thing, Dr. Messina gets me fit. He gives me iron shots every week in the buttocks. It's iron, blood to get the blood level back to normal. He gets that back to normal, puts me on all kinds of medication, and I'm getting stronger, getting back to normal. It took toll all from when I was a kid, from when I was eight, up until all what I was engaged in. It was taking a heavy toll on my life. So we'll go to see the doctor in Beverly Hills. He was a forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Obla. And I sat down with him, and he said to me, what is your problem? I said, I'm on the run. He went, what do you mean on the run? Oh, you mean on the lamb? I went, yeah, I'm on the lamb. He said, what for? So I told him everything. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you a prescription. I'm going to put you on Valium and an antidepressant. I didn't know what the antidepressant, I didn't even know what that meant. So it gets the Valium and the pain started going, subsiding, getting better. Had a lovely place. Wife comes over. I buys a, bought a new Cadillac. Seville, and I bought a brand new Mustang. Got the bar. Everything's going fine. I'm getting a lovely wage in. Wife comes over. Everything's fine. Doing great. So, on 2nd Street, you had Gold's Gym. Walked down there, so I thought to start. I'll start training now again. Everything was going fine. So they just opened a new boxing gym. It was um, Muhammad Ali had opened a gym. And it was beautiful. So I walked in one day. I just walked in, I seen the ring. And um, these two black guys sitting there. And I looked at them. And it was Muhammad Ali. And I walked in and went, hello, how are you? And it was his best friend, Jimmy Ellis. Jimmy was the, the WBA champion in 1972. And he was running the gym. And him and Muhammad Ali had fought each other. And they were best friends in um, Louisville in Kentucky. They were the best friends. So I said, can I come in the gym? And they went, yeah, sure. And um, I, took, I, I took private lessons off Jimmy Ellis. I, had, I was having private lessons with him. Yeah, boxing. 
And he said to me, why don't you fight? I went, nah. I said, and I was telling him all about Liverpool and that, you know, all the great fighters, John Conti. We had some great fighters telling about Ronnie in New York and that it was great. So anyway, we, we settled down. My wife comes over. She gets a job with a, um, with a real estate company and I give her the Mustang. Everything was fine. So one night, Eddie's in the bar and in the bar. We get some nutters coming in, you know, walking up down Santa Monica Boulevard. We used to just chase them, you know, the homeless and, you know, we just helped them out and say, you know, are you okay, mate? You know, we never really, but we just didn't want them around the bar. But we'd help them in a certain way, give them some water, give them like some French fries or something like that. We never, we never abusive to them. We always helped them. So this night it was, we, we decided we'd build the bar up and have a disco. So we got this disco come in and we advertised it and the bar was shocking. So I was always worried that we were going to get robbed at gunpoint. Because it was known then. Where I'd lived, he'd gone into a liquor store and he'd shot a Vietnamese woman for nothing. But when you've got a bar like this taking a lot of money, you know, it was like unbelievable. So this night, about eight o'clock, six, six Welsh guys walked in. And um, one of them said, he was, he was like a weightlifter. And he said, oh, there's a fucking scouse bastard in the kitchen. And I heard him and he was referring to Eddie. And I looked at him and I thought, there's six of them. So I went around the kitchen. I used to, I used to carry, um, I had two hammers and I hatched in case of any trouble. So I said to Eddie, come here a minute. I said, see this crowd here? And he went, what? I said, they're going to start. I said, see there, Eddie? It's two hammers. If they start, just get hold of one of the hammers. I said, well, I'm going to do it a lot of them. Eddie looked at me and went, okay. He was a bit nervous. I said, see that big fella there? I'm going to take him down in two seconds. Eddie went, ah, oh, yeah. I went, yeah, I'm going to do him. And then I'm going to do the rest of them. So next thing comes out. They, they quieten down. Now, my shift had finished and my wife was at home and I didn't drink. So I said, Eddie, nobody starts again. So no the fat for the fish and chips. Just... <laughs> I got the fat for the fish and chips and I said to Eddie, just the kitchen closed at 10 o'clock at night. So they were starting getting bevied all night. So I said to Eddie, turn the fat up. I said, and see this pan here? I said, just get it. Stand in the kitchen and give it to them. And he went, all right. I'll fucking give it to them. So anyway, two o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on my door. It's Eddie banging on my door in Santa Monica on 4th Street. He went, Terry, open the door. And I let him in. And he's full of fat. He said, I've done what you told me to do. I fucking gave it to the six of them. And the fat was boiling hot. But all the customers had got it as well. No. So anyway, all the coppers came in Santa Monica. And that. So Eddie stayed in mine. So this, this Welsh crowd had got a gun to kill Eddie. And I, so I went in at 10 o'clock and I opened the bar and the bar's full of fat all over the bar. It's fat everywhere. He'd got it and scooped it and he kept giving it to them. And I actually didn't think he'd do it. And he, he, he was doing them all in. And the, three of them had gone to hospital. They, they were burns. So next day I goes in the bar and we had the cleaner come in and she f slipped on the fat as she come in, she fell over and I got it up and that we cleaned the fat up and it was all over the place and we were going to get the bar up at 10 o'clock. So next thing, three of the Welsh guys walked in and they went like that to me. You, you fucking scouser. And I went, listen mate, calm down will you? He went, where's that nutter? And I went, I don't know, mate. 
And he went, we're going to fucking kill him. So I said, listen, listen. You better, I said, sit down and have a drink with me. I thought, I better not let this escalate again. It's going to get really nasty. So next thing, he came in and I said to them, listen, let's become friends. You just can come in here whenever you want. I'll pay for all your food. I'll buy you your drinks. We're just scousers and use a fucking Welsh. And forget about Eddie. I'll sort it out, okay? We want peace. So I sorted them. Next thing, the six of them became my friends. And they came in the bar every night. And I gave them beers and that, you know, Budweiser's. And they were all right. And then I introduced, I said, Eddie, come and say hello to them. Everything was peaceful. So it went on for a while. Now upstairs we had six apartments. A few weeks later, Scouser comes down. And he goes, um, where's Terry? And I went, all right, lads, where are you from? He said, Norris Green. I went, all right. He said, I've heard about you. I went, all right, do you want a drink and that? And he was a good kid. So that night, the owner came in and there was a bit of a, a ba- banter in the bar that they were legal. They hadn't paid the rent upstairs. And the owner came to me and said, they haven't paid the rent. So next thing, I said, well, leave it for now. Let them pay later. No, they're going to pay the rent and all. I said, no, leave it, Victor. Just leave it. So next thing, it was about, it got on to nine o'clock and Victor had a few drinks. And he starts going to me, you fucking scouse bastard. To me, it's your fucking fault and all this and that. And I said, hang on, mate, calm down. So anyway, I lost it. I actually lost it in the bar. So he was by a phone. And he was arguing with me, and I was actually arguing back. That Liverpool way of arguing back at him. So I just, I stood back, and I just threw a right hand, and I hit him, and I knocked him out. And I'd done him in. His wife had called an ambulance, took him to the hospital, and his nose was broke, and his jaw was broken. And I went... Oh my God. And I went home and I went, what have I done now? Next thing, I had to pack a bag. Ended up, the police had gone to see him in the hospital. They'd call the police. And next thing, oh God, I'm going to get nicked now. Again. For, you know, grievous bloody arm. And, pff, Jesus Christ. What am I going to do? So I had to leave the apartment with my wife. Got a motel, and I'm stuck in a motel. Victor gets out to the hospital, and I sends Eddie down to the bar, and I said to him, "If he, if he presses charges against me, I'd, we'd still had the investment in the bar. I came up with an idea that I was going to burn the bar down. I was going to torture, and then I was going to move on." That was the only way that I could persuade his mind. So Eddie went to visit in the hospital and he said, has the police been? He went, yeah. And did you give Terry's name? He went, yeah. He said, well, Victor, you can't prosecute Terry. I'm telling you, Victor, you're dealing with the wrong person. The bar will be burned down. He's going to burn the whole bar down. So Victor agrees. Meets Victor in the bar a week later. I apologised. And he puts his arm around me and he says, OK, you've got to leave. I've got to give you your investment back. I said, OK. Got my investment back. And I left. I left. So my other brother, Alan, had come over. I moved back into my apartment. And... We'd gone to a place called the Tudor House. And I got a job as a baker. The manager took us as a baker, doing all the steak and kidney pies, the sausage rolls, and me and Alan got in. So we, Alan's, Alan became the head baker, and I was the assistant baker. 
But he brought a confessionary bacon in. He brought a confessionary bacon in in the Tudor house. So we're there for a few months. I think it was 1980, late 80, and the beginning of 81. So the baker was showing us all the good. He was, a, he was a great baker, but he was a little weasel. And I was suffering from the my spine with my nervous system. And I went in the back to sit down. He went, um, I, am, I want you in the fucking bakery. Don't you be sitting down in there. And I went to him, hey, mate, who are you talking to? I said, don't talk to me like that, I said. I said, I'll fucking bury you in a minute. And he shit himself. So him and Alan would work together. So one day, I leave the bakery. And I go up to, to see Victor, to have some fish and chips. Next thing, the immigration raid the bakery and they get Alan and they get his wife she's the cashier so I come down after an hour and I see all these cars at the back of the bakery and I'm looking so I just done one I knew there was something wrong so they got Alan put Alan in downtown detention in deportation the bail was $6,000. So the owner of the shooter house had bailed Alan out and his wife, and they got out. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do here now? Elizabeth Taylor, the butler. <laughs> I'll have to do what she told me. So I drove to Beverly Hills, and I walked around. I parked the car. I had, I had a big... Um, Red Cadillac was gorgeous, like a big movie star, you know. And I just parked it on Beverly Drive and that, and I walked up and down Beverly, Beverly Drive, and I was looking everywhere for agencies. And um, I found one. It was called the Sandra Taylor Agency. And I walked in and I said, um, do you do any butlers on that? And she went, yeah, yeah, we do butlers. And, you know, would you like to register? I went, yeah, okay. I said, is, is there any more agencies here? She went, yeah. She went, there's one down the street called the International Agency. So I registered and I went down to the International Agency and I walked in and this woman was sitting there. She had glasses on and that and her hair was all beautiful. And I looked, and there was all film stars on the wall and I looked at them all and I was looking at them all going, wow, this is beautiful. And um, she said, what's your name? I said, my name's Terry Mugan. I said, I'm a butler. I was the butler head butler on the Queen Elizabeth II. Oh, she said, here, fill the application in. She said, I can, I can place you tomorrow in a job. And I went, that's nice. So, fills the application in. And I had my Merchant Navy um, Seaman's card and my book and, the sh and all where I'd been on the ships. And I'd done a few other trips on the ferries to Olyhead. And in, in the book, it had in the book, PRS, Penthouse Room Steward, and it was done in red, which meant it was very high standard. So I took that standard and I used it to my advantage. And I told her, I said, look, I'm, I'm one of the best butlers on the Queen Elizabeth II. So I'm sitting with her and she said, I've got the ideal job for you. And I said, okay. She said, I'd like you to come back tomorrow morning and I'm going to arrange an interview for you in the hills in um, Hollywood I went okay not thinking like who it is or, <laughs> or ever anybody and she went um, do you do formal service I went yeah I can do white gloves I'll serve with white gloves and we do serve on the left take of the right and I'll do the silver service Oh, you can do all that? Oh, I said, yeah, that's that's what I'm trained in. So she said, well, I'll have you eat, uh, meet um, Mrs. Eastwood tomorrow. <laughs> so I looked at her and I went, um, Mrs. Eastwood. I said, who's she? 
She said, oh, she said to me, that's um, Clint's wife. She'll be doing the interviewing. I said, okay. So this was the new life <laughs> that me, I was going to start. Went home, got all ready, put my suit on. Next morning, my nerves are killing me. Go to the agency, got the address, went to the hills in Hollywood, parks the car outside, gets my briefcase, all my references, goes into this big mansion, presses the intercom. Hello? Yes, Mr. Mugan. I'm here to see Mrs. Eastwood. Next thing, the, these big gates open, goes in. Oh, come in. This woman, it's Clint's wife, blonde hair, beautiful woman. And um, her name was Maggie, Maggie Eastwood. So I addressed her like appropriately. Mrs. Eastwood sits down and uh, she said, how would you like to move to Carmel? So they'd never had an English butler. They were fascinated with, you know, an English butler. I changed my accent a little bit so that they could understand me a bit more. Did you sound more proper British? Well, actually, more Scouse, but toned the Scouse down, spoke slowly, and made sure that they could, that they could understand me. And sometimes I'd lose it. And then in between, they used to say, I love your accent. It's lovely. <laughs> And I go, oh, yeah, okay. You just sound like John Lennon. <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah, you sound like John Lennon or Paul McCartney. And I just looked and went, oh, that's nice. Okay. So the arrangement was for me, at the end of the interview, to move to Carmel. I got offered the job. So at the side of the house in Carmel, she told me where it was. It was on the 17-mile drive. And it was a big, beautiful brown wooden home that was built beautiful. They had deer and they were in the garden. It was beautiful, very excluded. But they'd built an extension on it. So I asked her, I said, is it possible that um, my wife could move with me? Oh, she said, absolutely. And I said, maybe she could work with you. So anyway, flies to Monterey Airport. In a jet. Um, next thing, gets to the airport. This big Mercedes pulls up. It's Maggie. She's got the two kids in the back, Alison and Kyle. And I went, hello, how are you? And it was Clint's two kids. So she gets us in the car. So she said, we're going for lunch. So Clint's had a restaurant called the Hog's Breath Inn in Carmel. And we go for lunch. And said, this is uh, me and my husband's restaurant. And I'm sitting there with her. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Beautiful. Next thing, gets goes to the house. And it, was, it was at the weekend where the letters settled in. So about five o'clock, goes in the kitchen. I had the keys and that. And I wanted to sit, take a look at the kitchen get familiar with the house. Next thing, I just turn around and he hears a voice. Hi, how are you doing? It's Clint. <laughs> and he went, I said, hello, Mr. Eastwood, how are you? I said, my name's Terry Mugan. Nice pleasure to meet you, sir. I said, I'm the butler. And he went, pleasure to meet you. My wife's told me all about you. I said, thank you, sir. Can I get you anything? Can I get you a drink? He went, yeah, I'll take a beer. She had the sum in the fridge there. I'll sit out on the patio. I got him a beer and I walked out to the patio and I gave him the beer. And he was a quiet man. And I just went in the kitchen. So we started on the Monday. And uh, I made a curriculum for the home. It was just a regular house like, but it was overlooking the 17 mile drive. It was absolutely gorgeous. So that, I remember the first night, it was very, they didn't want a formal. Some periodically they would add formal and informal because of the kids. So the, uh, the whole objective was to win the kids over. And I taught Kyle how to hit the speed bag. Clint had a speedball in the house. And I thought I'd like to teach Clint how to do that. But I taught the son. And um, Alison, I taught her some cooking lessons, how to do 
um, scrambled eggs and toast and bacon. And um, I won the kids over. That was the main... If you win the kids over, you're laughing, aren't you? And um, I didn't have much interaction with Clint. So I stayed for about four or five months. And then all of a sudden, he was at home at the time. And he had this beautiful 6.9 Mercedes. And he come in one day. And he said, Terry, um, do you want to do the car? I said, Leah, I'll do it for you. And I used to wash his car and I'd wax it for him and everything, and he loved it. I, did, I didn't have much interaction with him. I was a little bit, um, probably, I'd say they used the word infuriated. I was actually infuriated of him. It's not until you get to know them. His wife was more, like, relaxed. And then all of a sudden, he left. He left the residence. He left the residence. And he'd gone. So I would take four days off and I'd fly back down to Santa Monica. And when I came back, there was another guy there. His name was Henry Weinberg. And he dated Elizabeth Taylor. And I found him to be very obnoxious. And he was very abrupt to me, um, speaking to me um, um, inappropriately, you know, his behaviour. And I went, hmm... So anyway, I said to my wife, I said, I think I'll, uh, I'm going to move. We'll move back to Santa Monica. And I gave her two weeks notice. And she was like upset. Because my wife had done some reception work for her. Because that's what my wife was. She was a receptionist in the bank. And um, we told him that we were leaving. And the kid was upset, Kyle. He was doing a movie at the time called Onky Tonk Man with Clint. And it was sad because the kids were really lovely. Alison went on to be a model in LA and um, Kyle never took the acting up. He became a musician later on in life. So eventually I left. And I got a call on the landline because Maggie had my phone number. And she went, Teddy, where are you? Are you work? And I went, no. And then in between, I'd gone down back down to my, my daddy's gym to see Jimmy. Started training with Jimmy Ellis again, getting more fit, stronger. Met a few fighters in there. One of uh, the welterweight championship of the world was um, Carlos Palomino. And I uh, struck up a lovely friendship with him. Because I said to him, I was, I, I was at your fight in London when you fought with Dave Boy Green in 1977. He went, really? I went, yeah. I was at that fight. I said, yeah. And he was he was like delighted. And um, I stuck this friendship up. So the call was from Maggie for me to go back to Carmel Valley. He was his name was Merv Griffin. He was a, a multi billionaire. He owned a show called Jeopardy. He said, Oh, um, I've told this guy all about you in our country club in Carmel Valley, and he's looking for a butler. He, he said, she said to me, would you consider it? Um, he'll meet you in, um, on his studios on Sunset and Vine. So I decided, ah, you know what, I'll just go anyway. So he got my number and he called me, and I had an answering machine, and Merv called me, and I called him back, and I set an interview up with him, so I went up to Sunset and Vine and I goes in his office and I goes in the office and he welcomes me and had a lovely suit on, dressed as usual as the butler. And he said to me, well, do you want to fly back up to Carmel Valley in my private jet? I said, yeah, okay. And he explained to me the ranch that he had and it was set on the top of Carmel Valley, overlooking the valley. It was absolutely beautiful. So we arranged to meet at Van Nuys Airport. So when I got to the airport, I had my case with me. And I was looking at the plane. It was a, a little six-seater. And there was a guy standing next to him. He was about 22. Very good looking. American. Dead-tanned. Handsome. 
And Merv said to me, oh, this is my friend Tony. So we'll put two and two together. I thought, hang on a minute. This has got to be his boyfriend. This toy boy. Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A forward slash Sean Atwood, S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T Wood to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. Shall we get on the plane? Goes up. Gets off in Carmel. Lands in Carmel Valley. There's a car waiting for us. Had a chauffeur. Goes up. Goes to the ranch. He said, Teddy, this will be your house here. Big 5,000 square feet house overlooking the valley. Goes to the main house. Decorated with all, all the interviews that he'd done. The Beatles, John Lennon, all the big stars, awesome wells. He did everyone in the world. So that night, he said, Teddy, what would I have so, oh, for dinner? So they wanted Philly Mignon, asparagus. And mashed, in, oh, actually, I did um, English roast potatoes for them, and they'd never had that before. So he asked me to join them at the table, which I thought was nice but unusual at the time. It wasn't my job to sit with anybody at the table. I wasn't part of the family. I was the butler. So I joined them at the table, and then all of a sudden, I could see this atmosphere can want to be crazy you know and you know and Terry you know this and um, me and Tony you know we've had this relationship for quite a while now and oh yeah oh, okay you know like Scouser so like I'm going yeah okay that's nice isn't it so I didn't know what to do <laughs> I know where this is going <laughs> so next thing I was there for two weeks but I wanted to leave the next day <laughs> I wanted to leave. I thought, well, I'm, I'm stuck here. So I left and he said, oh, Terry, you can come and sit on the sofa if you like and watch the TV with us. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so I went like that. I went, no, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll just go to my room and I'll watch the TV. <laughs> so the next day, I was doing all the chores and I was cleaning up and everything, just as a regular penthouse butler. And I could see the bed that they'd been sleeping in the same bed. <laughs> and I was going, well, I'll, you know, I'll just mind my own business. I'll, I'll use diplomacy. I won't say nothing. And I'll just carry on. So a few nights later, they went out one night. And then the next night, um, I'd done um, a pan of scouse. You know, pan of scouse, just like Irish stew, you know what it is, but it's scouse. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was lovely. It was lamb and, instead of beef. And I set the table lovely. And then, um, Terry, would you like to join us? I said, no, I'm fine. Oh, no, we'd rather you join us. So I joined them again. I was going, oh, where's this going, you know? So anyway, where it went to was, we sat on the so he, he, he Terry, I want you to sit here. Come and sit here. And I, I, I sat there with them, and I was, felt so uncomfortable. And he said, um, you never know, it could turn into a threesome. No. <laughs> And I went, oh, my God. Just like that. Just like that. And he said, I think Tony likes you. And I went like that under my breath. I'll fucking knock Tony's head off. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, it went sour. So I perse persevered for two weeks, and he was flying back to L.A., and he thought I was coming back, got to Los Angeles, and I went with him to his office, I said, you know, 
you put me in a, a very awkward position in my life. I said, I can't return. So, and that was it. And he paid me. So eventually, I'd left Merv Griffin, where they would go back. I went to the international agency. And I thought, maybe I'd just stay around Beverly Hills this time. And I was close to Santa Monica because I had the apartment. Goes back to Dora, automatically got a job for you. Job was for a couple called Mr. and Mrs. Feldstein. They owned a, a bank called the Mitsubishi Manufacturers Building on Wiltshire Boulevard. Absolutely multi-millionaires. And they, didn't, they bought a home. It was the former home of um, Jack Benny, the famous comedian. And it was on um, a, a street called Roxbury Drive. Roxbury Drive was full of all the stars. Bugsy Siegel, um, Lucille Ball, Colombo. Actually, Lucille Ball's house was next door to the Felstein's and Colombo's was on the other side. So I goes to get this interview and I met them. It was, it was silver service every night. They wanted silver, white gloves, very appropriately done. So I took the challenge and um, the money was good. I took the challenge. Actually, she was English, but she never told me she was English. I thought that was very unusual with her. They had three children that went to the, uh, the Beverly Hills High School. My job was to show for them. And then during the day, I'd do all the chores and I, and I put a cu curriculum for the house. Anyway, I stayed a few months and I found that the, the children was, couldn't ruin a job. They would come home and spit on the, the mirrors and I had to clean it. And I thought, you know, oh, you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. It really put a bad taste in my mouth. And some people, it was a, more of an experience that, you know, you can't please them all the time. You just couldn't please them. And very super rich. And um, one of the best things, I just took the Rolls Royce and I'd go out for the ride and said I was going the car wash. That was the best part of the job, <laughs> of like of most of the jobs. And so I stayed a few months on that and I wasn't happy there. I was never happy. And then on my weekends, they'd always want me to work on the weekends. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. Um, this woman particularly, I remember now, comes back to me. She was so paranoid about cleaning that she would get a mirror and put it underneath the, the rim of the toilet to see if it was clean. And I caught her doing it. And she'd come back to me and she'd make notes. You have not cleaned underneath the rim of the toilet. And she shocked the life out of me. And when I was doing my job, she would go on me. And she was that paranoid that she kept checking it and checking it and checking it and checking it. And I went, I, you know, she's supposed to be English, but she turned into an American. And I went, this is ridiculous. And that was one of the things that really got to me. And actually then I wasn't feeling that good as well about the whole situation, but I couldn't get out of it because it was good money. And at night, I always remember once they had this party in the back garden and... Um, I was doing the design of the tables and the, the tablecloths, pink with white lace um, napkins, and I was designing it all beautiful. And this woman, I just heard this, hello, hello. And I looked to me right, and I knew Lucille Ball lived next door. And she goes, hi, how are you? Who are you? I went, oh, hello, how are you? Um, I said, I'm the butler. Really? She said, um, could you do me a favour? I said, what is it? She said, come over here. She went, um, my maid's off today. She said, could you take my garbage cans out? I said, yeah, I'll be over in a minute. So it goes out, walks around the house, goes at the back of Lucille's. Now, the garbage cans can't, they can't be put out in the street in Beverly Hills. It's against the law. <clears throat> They had to be put out in the alleyway at the back of the house. So she had them in the house, in, in the garden. 
And, you know, they're these massive, big... Have you ever seen the garbage cans in America? Yes, huge. They're like, uh, enough for like 20 families. You could put 20 families' garbage in them, but they've got six of them. This, it's it's crazy. Um, most of the time, they're empty, but they've got so many. So it goes over, gets the garbage cans out, and I thought, oh, oh I've got to say something to Lucy. Got to say something nice to her, you know, build some rapport. So I turned around to her and I said, um, I said, you look like my mother. <laughs> I said, my mother looked like you. My my mother had red hair. And she went, really? I went, yeah, I said, you look like her. And I um, started laughing and joking with her. And then I said, um, anyway, you're welcome. And um, she, I said, is your maid here next week? I said, I said, if I'm still here, <clears throat> I said, you've got to make me a cup of tea. Anyway, I was dying to look forward to next week, but the job was getting me down a little bit and I wasn't feeling that good. I was still taking the shots of iron and I was still on the antidepressants and I was also on the Valium. And I was going into a, a decline. Um, I was going into what you call a mental breakdown. The mental breakdown was due to um, the trauma of um, PTSD. It was multiplying in my brain of being actually on the run. I'd go and see Dr. Obler and they wanted to know where I was going on my break in the afternoon. If you work 12 hours in Beverly Hills, the law, the California law is that you're, you're allowed three hours break. And I'd have to go to the doctor's. And I'd go and see Dr. Obler and say, I don't feel well. Well, we can give you a stronger medication. No, I said, I've got to function in the job. I said, I can't function. It was affecting me. You know, it was just affecting me. And he said to me, um, well, um, it's possible then if this is affecting you that we might have to take you into hospital. And I looked at him and went, what, what do you mean? He said, well, we'd have to put you on a drug called Thorazine. And I went, what's that? Oh, he said, it's for people who are having breakdowns. But you'd, you'd probably have to be admitted into the hospital. And at the time, I didn't show that I was bad, but I was bad. I was having nightmares with the police. You know, the police um, putting the gun in my head. And that's all I... And it was just... It was horrible. And then it was just my life. It was just all come back to me. You know, it was just building up and building up. So I stayed another week or two. And I actually did say to Lucille Ball on the day... I remember it was a Tuesday... And um, I said to her, before she leaned over, I knew the maid wasn't there because I didn't see the car. And um, I thought, she's going to ask me to take them garbage cans out. I want a cup of tea with her. I just don't know why. I just She was a lovely woman. And um, I shouted. She, she popped her head up. I, was, I went out at the same time in the garden. And um, she, she popped over and I went, have you got that cup of tea? And she went, yeah, come over. Anyway, I went home and she made me a cup of tea. It was one of the highlights of living with the Roxbury ghosts. That's what they're called in Beverly Hills. All the Roxbury ghosts are all the film stars. Male or female, that's what they call them. I was sitting with a Roxbury ghost and it was Lucy. And what did you guys talk about? We talked about England and Ireland. She said she was Irish. She said she was Irish and she said, what are they like next door? And I felt like saying that a gang of twats. <laughs> That's what they are. They're not in the real world. I said, I'm going to be leaving. I told her. <clears throat> anyway, I started getting a little bit fit. I gave me notice in. And I left the Felsteins. But it was an experience. I started now to get the experience. I went back home to my wife. And um, she was working for the receptionist, for the big um, real estate company. I went home. I was glad to be back home. So I started going back in the gym. Went down. Well, I'm going down to see my Amadali, see if he's in there with, with um, Jimmy Ellis. Jimmy's always there because he ran the gym. And then she's me like, and uh, this big fella walks in. It's Joe Bugner. Joe, Joe Bugner, the heavyweight. He fought my Amadali a few times. He fought Henry Cooper. And it's all right, mate, how are you? Starts talking to him. And, you know, 
Anyway, I'd worked out in the gym and Joe was working out with um, Jimmy Ellis. And he said, what are you doing? I said, he said, I'm going to go for a walk. So I, I, I went for a walk with him down the pier. We went for a walk on Santa Monica. And we walked down on the pier. And we had to walk around the pier and we came back up and that. With Joe Bugner. A lovely, lovely man. Yeah, lovely guy. So I, I had a break for about a, a month. And then the agency kept calling me because I was what you call placeable because I was English and I was a butler and she would not leave me alone because, you know, they get a good, they actually get a good commission. So she told me to come in. So I got a bit strong and I went in, I was feeling okay. And she said, Terry, I've got the most marvelous job for you. I said, you always say that. <laughs> You've always, I said, I hope this one is good. I said, I'll take it. She said, well, it's a guy, um, I'm going to tell you who he is. His name is Frederick Wiseman. He's one of the biggest art collectors in the world. And he's bought this beautiful Spanish ma mansion. Now, you've got Beverly Hills. And then above that, there's Holmby Hills. Holmby Hills. And she told me you lived on there. And he's got this mansion. He said, it's between you and a French chef. You'll get the job. Well, at the time, I didn't feel like I needed competition. You know, my competition was myself. That was my competition. That's what I'd learned. I wasn't interested in anybody else because I knew what I could do. And I go to this house and it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely set in home builds. And I'd, I'd been past it and I drove past and I'd asked someone... Who lives on the street? And I found out that it was a place called Carrollwood Drive. And it was George Addison lived next door to him. On the other side was Barbara Streisand. Down the street was Gregory Peck. Rod Stewart. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> At the bottom was Elvis. And facing Elvis was Michael Jackson. <laughs> wow. What a neighbourhood. Definitely. What a bleeding neighbourhood. Anyway, I went to the home. I was dressed immaculate. I put my best suit on. I thought, I've got to impress this guy. Now, what I liked about the job, it was one, it, it was one man. One man. No children. No dogs. And I, this is what I was learning now. I didn't want the responsibility of children or animals because I wanted to do my job. Next thing, he interviews me. Oh, he said, you'd be pay Little guy was very powerful. And actually, he owned um, Toyota. He actually owned Toyota. He, well, Toyota used to be called to Toyota. And they switched the A, called it Toyota. Yet they switched it. In, in Japan, it was Toyota, and then they called it Toyota, and he bought the franchises from the Japanese. Wow. And he became the biggest distributor in America, Frederick Wiseman. And when he was young, he was the president of Hunt's Foods, and he married Marsha Wiseman, who was the sister of Norton and Simon, the big museums, the big art collectors the, in um, Pasadena. So anyway, as the interview, he said, oh, I love you. You know, the Americans, they all love you. Next thing, I didn't hear nothing for a week. Phones to you. Oh, he hasn't, he hasn't made his decision. He's between you and a, a French chef. I said, well, is the French chef a butler? He said, no. So, the two girls that were his secretaries worked downstairs and I'd met them and he went to them and he said to the both of them, who would you have as the butler? And he said, there's only one butler. <laughs> <laughs> He's not French. <laughs> <laughs> He's not French. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Englishman. So I was hired as his butler. 
Wow. wow. Goes into this home. Beautiful. It's got the most beautiful artwork you've ever seen in your life. Henry Moore, Lichtenstein, um, Giacometti, David Ochney, Andy Warhol, all of them. Ed Rouget, all the great starters in the world. And I didn't understand it. Didn't understand the artwork. But the position that I was in, that I'd been put in, was absolutely beautiful. Anyway, I became the butler for Mr. Wiseman and moved in. Mr. Wiseman, his schedule, he would get up at six o'clock every morning, sitting in a little cove at a round table, eating raisin bran. And he'd have a three-piece suit on with a, a tie that was very ostentatious. And he, he looked absolutely beautiful. He had little glasses on and all his hair was weaved. He had all a hair transplant. <laughs> and all he ate every morning, all he ate every morning was the, the raisin bran. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I was left to have the home to myself. So I approached him and I said to him, my quarters was beautiful. My bedroom had looked over Barbara Streisand's estate. I could see the house. I could see, but I never ever looked ever. I, I just knew it was there. So I asked Mr. Wiseman, I said, you know, is it possible that my wife could move in? He said, oh yeah, absolutely. So I brought my wife over and she moved in the house with me and she helped with all the chores and she helped with all the cooking. And that. the home, I can't explain the home. It's on the um, Frederick Wiseman Art Museum. And um, this experience that I had was absolutely out of this world. And for instance, one morning I got up and he was in the kitchen and we had um, a blue corniche. And the corniche was like beautiful. And then we had some Toyotas and... He said to me, Terry, I want to go for lunch today. I said, okay. He wanted the Cornish. And he went, okay, we'll take the Cornish. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to Trader Vicks in Beverly Hills for lunch. I'd take him. I'd wait outside. Sometimes he would ask me to join him. I'd prefer not to. And I'd take him for lunch and he'd have a business meeting. And then I'd take him back home in um, the Rolls Royce. One of the best things was was the Rolls Royce. And he had a, a P.O. box on Sunset Boulevard for his mail. So I settled down in the job and it was easy, found it easy. And plus, he'd go back to Maryland for three weeks. So I had the house to myself. I've got the home to myself. <laughs> Would you say that was your favourite gig? Yeah, it was the best ever in my life. So when he was away, the butler would play. <laughs> and the butler did play. And I, I took advantage of it. But in a nice way. Not in a, a destructive way. It was in a nice way. And what I did was, I took the Rolls Royce one morning and I put the top down. And I went to get the mail. Now when you go through Beverly Hills, you've got all these streets. But there's one main street called Lexington. And I'm going through, it's 8.30 in the morning. The sun's shining, it's April. And it's beautiful. Picks the mail up. On the way back, I have the mail. And I wore a uniform when he was in town. And then sometimes I'd take me tie off. I wore a black suit with a white shirt and a black tie. Usually like it was very high, highly graded. So this morning I took the tie off. And I was driving back from Lexington. I'm driving down Lexington. And I was feeling the sun and feeling uh, um, the freedom and the position I was in in life. On this side of my brain, it was beautiful. But on the other side of the brain, it was dark. I was on the run. It, it, it stalked me. 
So I'm driving and I'm watching the sun and the sun's coming through the, the trees. And I'm driving this big, the most gorgeous car you've ever seen in your life. And I've got a pair of black sunglasses on. And I stopped at a light on Lexington. And I was like that, just with the sun, and I was like that. And I turned to the left, and I looked to the left, and it's Michael Caine. He's in the same car, but it was yellow. And I went, good morning, Michael. And he looked at me, and I went, not bad for the Scouser, is he? <laughs> 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 he went, <laughs> Do you know what he said to me? Go on. Do you know what he said to me? Did you just steal that? <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, Did you just steal that car? <laughs> I said, I said, I wish I would have. And I just I just took off. I took off. That made me day. That was it was absolutely brilliant. So I gone home and I just pressed these gates. And there these two big, oh, it was that big Spanish beautiful man had pressed the gates. George Harrison was living next door. And they put the home up for sale for George Harrison. And he was leaving. I think he was going to Maui, to Hana. He'd bought a place in Hana in Maui. And I'd never seen George. And I think I would have got to, to see him. So the good thing is that we had, um, we had like three acres, four acres on the land in the Hornby Hills. And it, it, it went down and we had a, a tennis court. So every morning I'd get up and I'd, I'd, I started doing strength training from what I'd remember from, from Borstal. And I got back into it, lifting weights, running in the morning, shadow boxing, doing all the things, getting strong to overcome the mental weakness. And I started building myself up. And he was away for quite a while. And I had the home to myself. So when he was home, there was one particular morning he was in the bedroom and he hadn't come down. And I'd gone up to the room to make sure he was okay. And I knocked on the door and um, he was in the back of the, the back of the bedroom and he had an hammer and, he, and he, he was banging holes in the wall. He used to move the artwork around like constantly, constantly and constantly move the artwork and Eventually, I knocked on, hello, Mr. Wiseman, uh, are you okay? I was concerned about his health. You know, we could have, anything could have happened to him. Oh, no, Terry, I'm just in here, I'm hanging up. I said, I've got your raisin bread downstairs. Oh, I'll be down in a minute. So he comes down the stairs and he's got this. Actually, it was the same colour as that little dog there. <laughs> same colour as what you, yeah, purple. It's the same <laughs> colour as that. Isn't that beautiful? It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Sit between us. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like that. So he comes down the stairs, and but it had black spots on it. And it was like, you know, like a jockey. You know when a jockey rides? So he comes down, he said, Teddy, I'll have a look. And I just looked at him. And I said, you look like a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, said, oh, I said, you look like a jockey. And he, he said, oh, God damn it. And he ran back up and he took it off. And he put his shirt and tie on and he came back down. And he just sat there. He said, anyway, I threw that in the garbage. And I, he put it in the garbage. So, you know, these experiences I'd had with him and um, I got friendly with him. And one day he, he called me into his office and he said to me, Terry, and I've ordered a Bentley from the UK and it's going to be the first Bentley that they've ever made. It was a Bentley Mulsanne and it's going to be arriving at the home. He said, but I won't be here. I'll be in um, DC, Washington. I said, okay. I couldn't wait for this Bentley to come. So anyway, gets a call at the house. It's on its way. It come from Long Beach in a container from England. This beautiful British racing green Bentley leather inside. I couldn't wait for it. 
when he went, they brought it in a, a big truck and they rolled it out, got it out. I inspected it and, and they parked it in the driveway and I just looked at it and I went, wow, what a car that is. Couldn't wait to take my uniform off. Went in the house, said to my wife, get ready, take your uniform off. Now it came with a, a cassette, Frank Sinatra. Come with this cassette. And the fella showed me the cassette and it was my way. So I thought, I'm, I've got to do this. They left, they inspected the car, everything was great. Next thing, I said, come on, to my wife, get in it. No one had had this car. No one. Beverly Hills. It was custom made. It was a quarter of a million. 250,000 quid. In them days in 83. Next thing, I gets in it, puts the tape in. And I was just driving like that. It was like a big tank. <laughs> so it gets to Rodeo Drive. Gets to Rodeo. And I put the music up. My wife just looked at me and she went. And I turned it up. Drove down Rodeo. And all you could hear is Frank Sinatra, my way. I did it my way. I drive down there. I stopped the whole of Rodeo Drive. I went down to Wilshire. Everyone was just looking at this car in the street. <laughs> went to the Beverly Wilshire. Turned around. Came back. Came back up. And I just stopped the whole of Rodeo. And I just started laughing. <laughs> And my wife was going, wow. If that would have been filmed, it was like out of a movie. It was beautiful. Took the car home. It was lovely. Anyway, you come home. And it was all to do with art. Um, he told me David Ockney was coming to the house. I'd met David Ockney. Um, I picked him up from his studios, actually, in Hollywood. And I drove him over. And he, he was buying art from David Ockney. Um, I, I'd met Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol had done all, you know, the Marilyn Monroe collection. He'd got the Marilyn Monroe, like five, five apiece, five million apiece then. Biggest, like, it's worth 170 million today. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we started to get to really know me and that, and we formed a, a nice bond together, you know. It was nice because he's probably looking at me, a young kid, and um, so one day, I told him, I said, like, you know, you haven't been in the Bentley yet. So can I drive you? Let's go. I'll, I'll take the Bentley. I said, they've got a nice CD in it. And he said, oh, that would be nice. So anyway, gets in the Bentley, gets him in, closes the door. And it comes down Carlwood Drive, goes past Elvis's house, Michael Jackson's. And we're going down to Rodeo Drive. And we're going to the, the Polo Lounge. At the, uh, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. So I put the tape on. And he, he took a wobbler. He went, get that fucking goddamn tape out of my fucking car. And I went, oh my God, what's wrong? He grabs the tape and he fucking throws it in the street. <laughs> he went, that fucking son of a bitch. And I went, what son of a bitch? And he threw it in the street. And he went to me, Terry, I'm so sorry. So we pulled up at the red carpet at the polo lounge. I'd been there many a time. And he got out and he said to me, come in with me. And I looked at him. I said, is everything okay? He went, it's okay, yeah. Come in with me. So there's a cafe there, the Polo Lounge, and there's a restaurant. So we never went in the restaurant. We went into the, the Polo Lounge. And he said, um, in 1969, I was in here. And the Rat Pack was here. He said, and I had a fight with Frank Sinatra. He said he made some... Words against me, against the Jews. 
because Wiseman was a Russian Jew and he'd made these, they were being loud, the Rat Pack. It was, um, I think it was Dean Martin's birthday and they were making all this noise. So Wiseman said, excuse me, can you keep the noise down? I'm having my lunch and Sonata said to him, who the fuck are you, you little Jew? And next thing, Wiseman gets up and he whacks Sinatra, breaks his nose and gives him two black eyes. And I've done a chapter in the book. It's called All Black Eyes. <laughs> That's the chapter that I've done in, in the book. <sighs> wow. So Wiseman was telling me the story. Next thing, the story that he tells me, Sinatra's bodyguard had intervened and hit Wiseman and blackjacked him. Now, for the audience, blackjack means, blackjack it could be with a kosh, where a blackjack is over the, the head. Or it could be, it was a phone. The bodyguard picked the phone up and hit Wiseman. Wiseman collapses. All of a sudden, an hour later, he's in Sina Sinai Medical Center with a tumor on the brain. The Rat Pack gets up, they all leave. Eventually, the police call Frank Sinatra in. And he said, no, he, he punched, he broke my nose and he gave me two black eyes. So they blame Wiseman. There was no charges against Wiseman. Or there was no charges against Sinatra. And it was left. And it was a very famous thing that had happened in the Polo Lounge. And he'd explain that to me. And that was the reason why he grabbed the tape. Out the Bentley. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable story that he had told me. And it was famous. Mm. And so we got along together and we'd been moving some of the artwork. So one day they were knocking a wall down in the house. They were putting Henry Moore. He loved Henry Moore. He was the, um, the great British artist. And he was a sculpture. And he said, Terry, I'm going to get this Henry Moore. I'm going to put it here. I think he told me it was $2 million. It's still there today. So they knocked the wall down. And we had this construction site come in. So at the end of the day, I had to check the house. I had to secure it to make sure that all the doors were locked, etc. Make sure the gates and, and I was good to the construction men. I'd make them tea, give them a sandwich. So this day, it was about five o'clock. My wife was there. She was doing some chores, doing something for them or with the secretaries. They were downstairs. So I was, I was upstairs and I was checking the rooms in the house. And I come across this door and I was just checking it. And I just checked it and it was open and it should have been locked. I've never seen it open. And I opened it, and there's a safe about, oh, I'd say about five foot by three foot. It's like a bank safe. So I put my hand on the door, and I opened it, and I looked inside, look around, and then I took to the left, and there was two big bags like this, and I picked them up. And I unzipped one of them, and it was full of $10,000 bill, um, increments of 10,000s. I pulled one out, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. And I went, wow. Picked the other one up. PSJ watching it. Diamonds, um, gold bracelets, and two PSJ watches there, well, PSJ. Probably were 25,000 each at the time. Today would be 100,000. What was my first reaction? Well, I'm having that. I'm yeah. having it. I'm having it. I'm on my way back to England. I'm going to buy myself said. a lovely house. Yeah, what stopped you? Well, this is the thing what stopped me. I put myself in the position of that. I'd sat at the table when he was away. And I'd ate the same breakfast 
which was raising brand. And I read the Wall Street Journal, and I read the US Today, what he had read. And it dawned on me, I was developing, and I was getting more educated. And I thought, what a beautiful life this is. Here I am, the sun shining in Holmby Hills and Beverly Hills. I'm driving two Rolls Royces. I'm making $50,000 a year. Wow. A man's given me a job. Why would I steal his money? What? Why would I do that? So I left it. And I played on it for 48 hours. Shall I go up? Shall I take some of it? Shall I take a few diamonds? Shall I take a gold necklace? And I told my wife, and my wife was so honest. My wife was, you know, it was the opposite. She'd never had nobody like me. And I'd never had no one like her that was so honest. It was the opposite directions we were in, but we were married. And we worked together, we got along together. And she said to me, Teddy, if you take that, you're going to be on the run again. And then it set in. My life had changed. Wise woman. Yeah. But it wasn't, it was also, she helped me change it. And then redemption set in. That was my life. That redemption had set in. I took the money and I took it down to the secretary and the jewellery. I said, Mr. Wiseman left the safe open. And the account, it was about 155,000 and probably 200,000 worth of jewellery. And he came back and he said to me, oh, Teddy, thanks, Sam. I had some petty cash in the safe. I want to thank you for him. I made a mistake. I didn't lock the... F I said, no, it's okay. Thank you, sir. Petty cash? Yeah, petty cash. <laughs> yeah, 155,000. Petty cash. Pocket change. Because he was a billionaire. Mm. He was a billionaire. So the artwork, we'd carry on, we'd move some... Um, Francis Bacon, he got too, too beautiful. Got this beautiful orange masterpiece of Frank Francis Bacon. And it was gold places and he came in and he was a perfectionist. And it was like, we must have wear the fortune, you know, absolutely fortune. And he said, this is Francis Bacon. And he would teach me the art and I was really getting into it with him. And I loved it. And I said, are you getting any more pieces? Oh, he said, Terry, I'm getting something that's going to come that nobody's got. And I was just like young and naive, but this man was, he'd come out of the coma. He'd come out of it. The tumour, he'd recovered from what they'd done to him, Sinatra. But his passion and his love was art. That was his passion. But he told me he had this piece coming. And he told me twice, but it was delayed. So we're upstairs one morning, and when he'd wake up in the morning, he had a blue mural on the wall, just blue with with um, white clouds on it. So he, he told me that when he woke up, that when he looked at the blue, he was looking at the sky and it made him happy. This was one of the things that he told me made him happy as opposed to being in, seeing a sign in medical centre with a tumour on the brain. And I thought that was very interesting when he said that. Because later on in my life, when I'd go to Hawaii, that's what I would look at. The sun and the blue skies in Hawaii and all the beautiful white clouds. You, you can't beat it. Anyway, I waited a few more weeks. And this masterpiece was coming. Comes in as his breakfast, as usual that morning. And he goes, Terry, I'm so excited. It's coming today. It's coming. And I'm looking, going, okay. He's all excited and I'm uneducated. Artwork, it's coming. Teddy, when it comes, let me know, okay. It's coming here today. So two o'clock comes, 
the doorbell goes. Hello, can I help you? Yes, got it. I'm a piece from Mr. Wiseman. Let's them in. This wagon comes in. These two guys get out, get the masterpiece. They bring it into the living room. And I'm just looking at it. I said, I've got to go and get Mr. Wiseman. He's told me that this is coming. Goes down, gets him. He runs. I've never seen him so excited about his artwork. They unfolded it. And he looked at it. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the mother and child, Picasso. The only one in the world. Oh. <laughs> of one of the only one in the world. And it must have been a fortune. You didn't find out how much it's setting back. I know what it's worth today. Go on. Um, today's value, mm. it's priceless. So, it's absolutely priceless. Then I'd say 100 million, which is very, you know, mm. it's up there. <laughs> yes. It's up there. <laughs> but money didn't, it didn't bother him. Of course. What was giving him his life was the art. Mm. That was giving him his life. So anyway, he said, Teddy, what do you think? I said, oh, it's absolutely beautiful, the mother and child, Picasso. So he said to me, where do you think we should put it, Teddy? He said, I think we should put it over the mantelpiece. I said, it's going to guide the house. And I said, your house will be blessed. He said, okay. I went to the garage, got the ladder, got a big hammer and some wire. And it was all ready with the ukes. I measured it. Got the measure on it and I, and I put it there for him. It's still there today. <laughs> that was in 1983. I'm just fascinated how you're using like a nail and a hammer in this day yeah. and age you'd use a drill to yeah. hang a picture. No, I the used risk a risk of it yeah. sliding and falling and breaking. But, yeah. you know, prices is Probably people. later on. Artwork, just later on. Yeah, that's what we did. It was always with a nail and, <laughs> nail and hammers. Right. All, the, all the artwork that we moved was with the nail and the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> <God>. <laughs> That's all I knew even... was the hammer, <laughs> the hammer, the hammer from the robberies. <laughs> didn't that, they didn't fall off or no, 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 no. solid as a rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so this life I had with this man that was a billionaire was absolutely incredible, and as I was learning so much. And one other occasion, he come out. He had his breakfast again, same to dance with him, and he got excited. He said, Terry, I'm so excited today. He was always excited. And he said to me, I don't know which car to take. I don't know whether to take the, the Bentley or the, the Corniche. And he was doing this. I don't know what to do. And I said, I can't make a decision. Because he, he was like that. So I said, do you want me to make the decision for you? And he went, go on. I'll do it. I said, let's take the Bentley. It's very rare that you've rode in it. You need to, you need to take it. I said, where are we going anyway? He said, we're going to Van Nuys Airport. Gets him in the car. Close the car. Like a gentleman. Gets him in the car. He said, I'm so excited, said he. I'm buying a jet. And I looked at him. I went, oh, that's nice. I always used to just say, that's nice. I couldn't ever question him, you know. Yeah. And he went like that. He went, um, yeah, I'm buying a G4. I didn't know what a G4 was. <laughs> so he gets to Vanny's airport, this plane sitting on the, the airport, and he goes like that. There's the plane, Teddy. This big, massive jet, G4. So I stayed by the car. And he looked at me and went, come on, get on the plane. So he gets on the plane with him. The pilots are there, private pilots and all that. We're going for a spin around LA in the G4. Gets on the plane. G4 takes off. Wow. What, like, what, like, it was like the Concorde. Mm. Takes off. 
It's like that. The pilots are made up. Just me and him sitting there. He said, what do you think, Terry? I said, brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. So he comes back, gets the pilots, and invites the pilots to stay at the house for the night. So what he's going to do, he's going to lease it, and then he's going to buy it. That's what he told me. So he asked me to take the pilots out. So I got the pilots in the car, and um, I took them in the Cornish. My favourite place was to go was Santa Monica Pier in Santa Monica, on the pier, where they'd done a lot of movies. They'd done The Sting, Robert Redford. And I used to love running when I lived in Santa Monica. Santa Monica to Malibu, and I'd always run up the pier. And it was beautiful. So I took them down there, gave them a few Guinness, and they're saying to me, Teddy, do you think he's going to buy the plane? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Takes them back to the house, got their head down the next day. They had done the deal, and he bought the G4. He bought the G4. He, buy, he buys the G4 and there's, he gets an artist. His name's Ed Rouget. Ed Rouget. And he paints the, the plane blue and, it, and he puts white stars on it. And he said to me, Terry, this was his, his uh, imagination of art. Ed Rouget is a very, um, very big artist in the world. And he said to me, Terry, the reason why I did this is it will, it will blend in the night when we go to New York because he owned a brownstone in New York. I used to go to New York with him and he had a brownstone in Manhattan and I used to take care of it for him. And we'd land at a private airport just outside JFK and we'd have a limousine and take it into Manhattan and everything. And so the, bl the plane would blend in the night blue with white stars on it it was unbelievable anyway i'd had so much experience with him and I'd, bert reynolds had moved in next door <laughs> bert reynolds and um and um, he was with lonnie anderson lonnie anderson at the time and i've seen him a few times i said hello to him and that was it you know and um so I was with Wiseman quite a while. And then had so many experiences with this man. And he said he was moving back to Manhattan. He was going to move back to New York or Maryland. And he said um, basically the job was coming to an end. Aww. It was coming to an end. But one before... I, before, I've got to tell you this one. He'd come up to me in the kitchen one day and he said, the secret service has come and said he to the house. And I looked at him and I went, the secret service? He went, yeah, they're going to be in two black limousines. He said, there's someone going to play tennis on the courts. I went, okay. So about half an hour later, the doorbell outside is going. I can see them on the camera in, in the kitchen. Hello. Um, yes, um, we've come here to play tennis. So I opened the gates, these two limousines pull in. Secret service. This girl gets out. She's with her dad. I looks over. It's Ronald Reagan. Hmm. The president. Yeah. His daughter Maureen had come to play tennis on the courts at Wiseman's. And I just looked and I went, hello, good morning. And he, I'm talking to the president, Ronnie Reagan. <laughs> and he's, well, yeah, um, she, um, Maureen's come to play tennis and, you know, she's going to be, I said, oh, yeah, she'll be fine today. So she gets out, she was a big woman, very overweight guarded by the secret service so they went down on the courts goes on the courts took them tea down give them water fruit bowls of fruit and everything she came quite a few times to the house but one morning there was one morning particular time unexpectedly the doorbell rang 
and I seen the car. It's a big black limousine. And I thought, is this Secret Service again? So I just automatically opened the case. He said he had a parcel, a gift. So I opened the gate. The car comes in. Ronald Reagan gets out. And he says, um, is Mr. Wiseman home? I said, no, he's not home. He said, could you give him this, please? And what it was, was a photograph of Ronald Reagan at the White House, and he'd signed it to Mr. Wiseman. Wow. And I took it, and I put it in the house. Took it, put it in the house. So I could feel that the job was coming to an end, and basically it did. That job had come to an end because he had moved. He kept the house and he was thinking of turning the house into a museum. And I finally had notice. He gave me a great severance package with um, $25,000. And I left. And I went back to Santa Monica. And then I knew the phone was going to start ringing again. So the butler was on the move again. So Hawaii next time. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Kahala in a Hilton. The, the Kahala Hilton. I was one of the most wanted men in Liverpool at the time. I was put on the 24 hour surveillance by a serious crime squad from London and Liverpool. And they said, come on, Teddy, we're going down the docks. We're going to do a whiskey iced. And the glass had gone right through my arm, chopped my fingers off. My arm was hanging off here, here. You're going to end up with life. If you carry on like this, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. We've made the headlines of the whole of the Liverpool Echo the biggest headlines, one of the biggest robberies that would ever happen in Liverpool. It's like an alarm, but it screams crazy to scare you away. That was going off. The alarm was going off in the post office and we could hear the police sirens as we were getting into the car, were smashing all over us. We had glass and milk all on our heads, all over our bodies. And as we got in the car, the glass and the milk was all in the car. He said, Terry, I'm taking you to Southampton. I've got a friend. He's going to get you on the Queen Elizabeth II, the ocean liner. Oh, there's a, a person upstairs in the penthouses. Um, they haven't showed up. Do you want to be the butler? And I went, yeah, okay. I'll be the butler. In life, when you've done something like this, what we were gonna do, I don't know where it comes from and who we are and why we're doing it, but it takes something, some men to do it. All right, Terry Mugan has flown from California to be with us today. He's never, ever told his story before. This is an absolute exclusive. He's had people biting at his heels to tell, to getting him to tell his story, but he's refrained, so we're deeply honoured. Terry is a man of respect all over the world, especially in the city of Liverpool, as you're about to hear. And this story is one of international dimensions because Terry's life, as you're going to hear, it may, it may be in multiple parts, um, growing up in Liverpool, he ended up in a, a home in Witness, actually, right by near where I grew, grew up as well. Horrific things happened to the people in the home and from so many people that go through things comes drugs, criminality, you know, that kind of behaviour. In, Terry, in Terry's case, it was armed robberies, heavy duty stuff. He has a stroke of luck with the cops and ends up fleeing the country, uh, he works on the QE2, <laughs> ends up Clint Eastwood's butler, which my dad 
found particularly interesting. So huge thank you first for coming all this way, thank man. Thank you, yeah. You know, oh, we are honoured. Thank you. Honored. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure. And me and Jen had a fantastic meal last night. Yeah. And we, we you know, we heard just a, a, some of the stories. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's so many more. You've also potentially got a book coming out this year as well. Yes. I'm going to hold this up now. That is just a draft, but you can you can capture the magnitude of the story there from Definitely. from that. And uh, so, if you are in the comments, we're hoping you know Teddy's going to get his book out later this year. But we like to get one of the guests before they go back to where it all began to tell us, you know, one of the most moving or hardest hitting stories. And I do believe you got one of those, haven't you, Tony? Yes, I was um, assigned to a home and. Um Truesdale Estates, just outside Beverly Hills. And the home was the former home of Elvis Presley. And the people at the home, they, they owned the, the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And they were looking for what you call a majordomo. For the audience, I'll explain what a majordomo is. A majordomo is a guy who runs the home. He's in charge of the chef, the butlers, etc. He, and he puts a curriculum together. And he just, he's quiet, he's nice, he's very experienced. He's got multiple challenges with all the chef and everybody, who they are and what they do, entertainment. And this particular home I went to, it was very unusual. I, I only got interviewed by the secretary and she was the one that hired me in said, you know, you'd be suitable for the job. And I took the position and my living quarters was inside the home. And I was wondering, you know, where's the owner? And she said, oh, he's, in, he's at the Kahala Hilton in Hawaii. And I was wondering, you know, where's Mrs. Weinberg? Where is she? So oh, the secretary, oh, she's down, she's a on the other side of the house. The house is about 6,000 square feet. So we carried on, I had the chef and we had the butler, we had a maid and I'd, I was writing the curriculum. This particular day, I was told to come and meet Mrs. Weinberg. I walked down this corridor and I always remember this corridor. It was like uh, the movie out The Shining. <laughs> and it had all the flickering lights and everything. <laughs> and I was walking down and I was going, oh my God, this is like going to get your head chopped off. That's how bad I felt. And these big doors, and the secretary opened the door and said, come in. She said, this is Mrs. Weinberg. And she was in bed. And I looked at her. I thought to myself, this is a very unusual situation. But I used my own imagination from my experiences. And I was looking at her. So you've seen this woman, very pale. And she had this red hair streaking down. And she said to me, how are you? She starts screaming at me. You've been in the sun too much. Are you the new major domo? I said, yes, Ms. Weinberg, how are you today? So I proceeded to ask what, this evening what she liked for dinner, and um, she said, I want bagels and lox and salmon. I said, okay, we'll have that for you for your evening meal. Then all of a sudden she said, how's that chef? I'm not sure whether I like him. I said, oh, he's fine. He's, he's from the Four Seasons. And she shouted throughout the room, I hope he's, he's as good as my chefs at the Kahale. Hilton in Hawaii, otherwise he's getting fired. And so I just looked at her and, you know, I was putting two, two together, but I wasn't making any judgments at the time. Anyway, we went on in the home and we, she was fine after a while, but then there was one particular morning that I did wake up and I heard the noise of rumbling. And my room was next door to the garage and I heard this rumbling. And I looked at my watch, and it was four o'clock. So obviously you think, you know, someone's going to steal the car, some, you know, from East LA or somewhere like that. 
they're going to come in and they're going to do something. I was a little bit like, okay. So I gets up, put my pants on, my shirt on, went out, and I just seen the smoke coming through the kitchen. And I went, oh my God, what's that? And I could smell it, and it was like fire, but it wasn't fire smoke, it was something else. So I ran out to the front door, opened the door, and I went round the back of the house, and I had a key, and I opened the garage to let the smoke out. And all the smoke came out, and then I slowly looking at the car, and I thought to myself, what's going on here, you know? Somebody tried to steal the car, or is there a short wire on the car, or something like that? And to my amazement, I seen a a pipe, and the pipe was going from the exhaust into the window of the car, and I just seen this pipe going all the way in. I was going, "What's that?" And then, as the smoke was clearing, I realised Mrs. Weinberg was in the car, and she had the pipe in her mouth. So I ran, I opened the door and I dragged her out and I laid her down and I was shocked. I was, oh. So I went back in the house to call the police and then automatically with that, they call the fire engine and then they call the ambulances, they all come together. And obviously, you know, she tried to commit suicide. And then to my amazement, I just stood there and they were asking me questions. Asked me lots of questions. I didn't say too much. So, so like, you know, I was um, more empathy than any judgments. And but one thing did happen. When they were given the oxygen, one of the policemen had said to me, and the, the paramedic, he said to me, do you know how old Mrs. Weinberg is, Teddy? And I said, no, I'm not sure. I said, as approximately, she could be like 43. And she's lying on the gurney. She's going to the hospital to um, see the Sinai. And she takes the mask off and she shouts, 44! <laughs> and I just looked at her and I went, oh my God. I sort of gave up. And that was one of the significant experiences that I had in Beverly Hills. And did you ever find out why she did try to commit suicide? Well, obviously, she was mentally ill. And then that story went on. And as I write in my book, in the end, it cut turns into tragedy. Mm. Wow. All right, let's go back to where it all began then in Liverpool. Well, I was born in Scotland Road. Scotty Road. Scotty Road, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, my mum and my dad, they had seven of us. My dad, yeah, my dad was a lovely man. My mother was lovely, lovely people. But, you know, it's, it's Scotland Road. What can you expect? And we moved out of there, and we moved up in between um, Walton, Anfield, and Norris Green. We were right in the middle. And I was about eight years of age this morning. And I got up, and I just went out at three in the morning, got dressed, and I went out. I don't know why. I still don't know why. And I goes to this place, and it was um, Freshfield Farm, milk. And in them days, Sean, you had the, you know, the horses that pull the milk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting outside, and this fella says to me, what are you doing here? I said, do you need any help, mate? And he went, you should be at school. What are you doing here? And I think it was, I waited an hour, it was about 4, 4.30. And anyway... He was probably lazy. Anyway, he went, go on, jump on. I'll get the kid to do the work. So I jumped on with him. I started delivering the milk and the orange juice and carried on. At the end of it, after like we'd finished about half seven, eight o'clock, and he gave me a bottle of milk and a bottle of orange juice. That was my breakfast. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was my breakfast. So then uh, I, just, I just wandered the streets. Mm. It was like I was wandering the streets. So I walked down to the Anfield Cemetery and I went in there and I, I hid the orange juice in the corner there. And then I went home and 
my father was like away. He was in the merchant navy trying to support the family. And what happened was the the school board, where is he? What well, is this kid? You know, why is he on the streets? And well, everyone was at school. I was the only one on the street. And um, so anyway, the, the following day, I got up the same thing. I did the same thing. And I went and uh, got the milk, delivered it and that. So Friday came and he said, make sure you come Friday. He said, um, you can help me collect the money. So I went round with him and I collected all the money with him. And I seen this bag. He has a bag and it was just full of like half a crowns at the time and trippences and sixpences. And I looked at it and I went, wow, look at that. And then he had a wallet inside it with loads of pound notes and fivers and, you know, the old 10 pounds and all that. And I just looked at it. And the temptation was there right there to take it. But I left it. The following week, I did the same thing. But I got there on the Friday, two hours before. And I collected all the money. I collected all the money. And I put it in a bag put it in a bag and I left. So I went to the Anfield Cemetery Jen, and I buried it there. I buried it in the cemetery and I used to go to the cemetery with my friends and I'd say, come on, I've got all this money. Then the police came to the house and they're looking for me. We want that bag. Where does he put it? And they took me into custody and that day I never said a word to them. I always found the police to be, you know, in Liverpool. We were always against the police anyway. So I, was, I just went against them. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I think I was eight. Oh, yeah, I was eight. 1965, actually. So what happened was um, I was targeted then. That was my life. That was the, the life of crime that I was about to go into. Did you manage to keep the bag yeah. hidden? Yeah, yeah, we kept and it. I remember where you planted it. Yeah, yeah, it was in the cemetery. <laughs> so um, I formed a gang. I had a gang. John Lally, um, Franny Jones, and my old friend, God bless him now, he's passed away, Ronnie Gibbons. And as I told you last night, Ronnie was the the brains behind the Brinks job in New York for the 8 million, and they'd done the movie on him. So when we got the gang together, we started, we, none of us went to school. So our next move was something else. We still had the money in the in the cemetery, but our next move was, what are we going to do? Where's the money floating? So it came on, it was the co-op. It was a Friday night. And we died the co-op all, all week. So after everybody getting paid on the Thursday and people getting the pensions and they were getting the money, Friday would be like a big day for them to go shopping. So, you know, we knew the, the co-op would close at six. So we, we went in at 5.30, goes in, got Franny to the, distract the cashier to go down and say, where's the can of beans? Franny would take the woman down the side. John would be outside with um, Gibbo. They'd be outside. And then I just jumped over and I had a bag with me and I just emptied the till. In them days, it was a wooden till and just cleaned a lot out. And we put it in the bag. And then we jump back over and Franny would just walk out. And we walked out and we just bump right back to the Anfield Cemetery. We buried it where the milkman's money was. And then what we did was we took about 20 quid. We went down to another shop and we bought, um, in them days you had the cigars, Hamley. We bought five of them and we were smoking cigars. <laughs> and then we took a taxi <laughs> over to New Brighton and we were smoking cigars and then we went along in New Brighton then we came back and then when we got back across the ferry in Liverpool the police were waiting for us and they took us into custody oh, first so John, John and Ronnie they were a little bit older than me so they got charged but I got released because I wasn't I was too young so that was another blemish to be just waiting to get me I didn't go to school. I had some little bits of school and that, but I was basically, I was just doing my own thing. I was like uncontrollable at the time. 
I felt like, you know, there was no guidance. I just did my own thing. And we'd go on the streets. So there was a place down in um, Long Lane in Liverpool. And it's all the factories. So one day, I said to John, I'm going down to Long Lane. And in days, you had a, um, a place called Mother's Pride where they delivered the bread. So the fella come out and I said to him, do you need some help, mate? And he went, yeah, go on, get in. And all the donuts and all that and all the lovely bakeries in the back and all that. I thought, this is nice. And the seat was warm, you know, and he was driving it. So in my head, I had Friday in my head when he would collect all the money. So I decided I'll wait, I'll, I'll, I'll work with him for a week or two. And then on the Friday, when we get back to the, the Mother's Pride, we'll go and I'll just take the bag and I'll take his wallet. And eventually I did do that. I took that and I put the bag over my shoulder and I got his wallet and I put it in my coat. And I walked up all the way up Long Lane in Vazakli. And um, I took it to, to my stash in the Anfield Cemetery. I took it there. This was the start of my life. <laughs> so then I was targeted again then. Oh, we've got to get this kid. We gotta get him. So there was a home in um, in um, Sefton Park called Westfield on um, Green Lane, and I was taken into care. Mm. I was I was taken into care. How did your parents feel about that? I think they were part of the wanting me to to have a better life because they'd seen the problems that I was having. So they was they were all for that to change where I was going to go in the future. But the problem there was that when I went into that home, um, it was mixed. There was girls and there were older boys. I was only eight. And one morning we were in line getting for our breakfast in the queue there. And, you know, I was playing around with a kid, as you do, you know, you're not in control. And I, I kicked a kid on by mistake and I didn't mean to. So the headmaster took me in and he, he came me. He came me on the hand four times on one hand and four on that. That's what they did in them days. So what I did, as soon as I had my breakfast, walked out and said, can I go to the toilet? Put my coat on, jumped right down Green Lane, on the bus, right back home. I was done, no control. Tried to get me back, no. Couldn't get me back. So we started doing our escapades again on the street, me, John and Ronnie. And um, we went to, there was a place in Norris Green called Broadway, um, which is, you know, it's been notorious, notorious in over the years. So we'd go there to Woolworths and we'd go in and we'd do a lot of shoplifting. Started shoplifting in there all over Broadway. And then we died. Always go back to the cemetery for some reason. It was like our comfort zone. I the can't cemetery. believe the money was still there. Yeah, after everything that was time. still there. Yeah, <laughs> nobody knew. No one took it. John didn't take any. Or well, Ronnie, you know, said, Teddy, can we have some money? So we'd go back and we'd just <laughs> say, yeah, you know, what you want? 50, you know, I want half a crown. Give us half a crown each. And they went, you know, at the time they were made up with me. Like, because they, I was like the leader of the gang. And then eventually... Franny had got caught. He'd, he'd bagged at home. And the police said that I was with him. And I wasn't with him because I was his partner. So they said, how to get this kid off the street would be to take him into care and to be charged with burglary. And I'd never done a burglary. And I was taken into care. So they took me into care and I was put on an institute on, um, in Walton called Menlove Avenue. I went in there, but I was isolated. They had a special isolation unit and I was put in there and I was like locked up on my own because they just, they knew I, I was always running away. And we were under a section called 1948 to be given three years in approved school. 
This was in 1968. So he goes back to the magistrates. And there's three magistrates in them days in the court. And the three said, oh, well, we'd have to teach him a lesson. But they'd already had the record from the co-op, the milkman. It was all recorded in them days. So there was only one way the magistrate could do would be to take me under in on a section 1948. And that section was three years for proof school. Yeah. I went into the back of the into the, the back of the, the magistrate's courts in the city centre. Now could you imagine this? Could you imagine this? You've got a ten year old kid. He's in the back of the magistrates. He's on his own in a the room. They've separated Franny from me. They didn't want us together. They've put these cuffs on me. They're about three pounds in weight each. They've got a black Mariah pulling up at the side of the door to take this little 10-year-old kid into custody and shipped off straight to Freshfield, Formby Freshfield, to the approved school. This is how my life started. I arrived at the St. George's approved school in Freshfield and my sentence was three years. I went in there. It was like a, it's like a big old castle. It stands out. You can see it. It's like a haunted, ma it's a haunted mansion. It sits today empty. It was run by the Nugent Care Society, which comes under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. No, no. Mm. Now, when I got in there, there was a little bit afraid. Didn't know what I was doing. We were lost. It was like being isolated, all the children. There was four houses. I think there was about 150 kids in there at the time. We settled down. But their policies, what they had for us, was the inside of the world, not outside it. Their policies that they could do what they wanted with us. And it was a breeding ground for paedophiles mm. and abusers and sadistic men. That's what this was about. So the outside world didn't know. Children were going there. One of the things that they had was Mr. Hickey, he was the um, headmaster. He would take the child's pants down and bend them over and he'd give them six on the bottom. And the poor kid couldn't sit down for weeks. His, his bottom would be black and blue. There was another guy in there and they had a, this thing where if you, you spoke in line, where they'd get you out and they'd this on the head here. They'd hit you on the front lobe, which probably was causing some kind of concussions because some time of damage. And it was spent me... I'd spent about two and a half years in this home, getting abused. One of the most significant things that stood out in my life was, which most of them were paedophiles, was proven later on under the Operation Care investigation in the North, Wild, North, North of England child abuse case. There was a guy, Mr. Matthews, he was a Marine. He was about six foot six. And what they do, they would say at three o'clock in the morning when they had the impulse, impulses for the children, they would say, okay, one child was talking, so we're going to get you out of bed. I'm like, you're going to have a cold shower. <clears throat> so they'd lead us down. This is in the middle of the night getting us up at three o'clock in the morning. They take us for the cold shower, put the showers on, and they'd say, soap the left leg, soap the right leg, soap the left arm, soap the right arm. Okay, turn it around now, soap each other's back, bend over, face the wall. This is what this is what the situation was going on. And we couldn't do nothing about it. There was children that did run away. One of the things that stuck out in my mind, there was two children that ran away in the summer and they went over the sand dunes in Formby 
and the tide came in and unfortunately we were getting chased and they had lost a life. Oh. And it was quite a significant thing at the time. But the children were so suppressed in their minds. They were, well, I would say the brains were absolutely cold because they were just, they didn't know what to do. My father had had a heart attack. I was 12. So I decided, I got a letter and one of my sisters said that my dad had had a heart attack and he was in um, the hospital and they wouldn't let me visit him. Oh, no. So I decided to run away and I went to a hospital called Walton Hospital and I went into the hospital and I found out the ward that he was in and I, and I sat next to him <laughs> and um, hmm. he had all the tubes on him, beep, 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 and I was just like, oh, my poor dad, you know. And my dad woke up and he went, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I went, hello, dad, how are you? <laughs> and, you know, because I love my dad, you know. And um, very sad, actually. Anyway, I left when the, the time was up, but I walked the streets and um, got caught, got taken back automatically. Where did I go? Right into the headmaster's office. Bends over, six of the cane. And then they put like um, a white jumper on you because for, be, um, for being absconded, uh, you, you know, you're absconded. And you had to stand on the line for hours. Anyway, we, after that, I moved out. And then um, I was released. I was released from there. And then I had one day of freedom. I stole some food and I was at a bus stop. I got recommitted. Took me back to Menlove. Started again. Another three years. Mm. So then um, decided to run away. Ran away. This is when it starts. Back onto the streets of Liverpool. Um, started shoplifting. Got caught. Back to um, magistrates. Recommitted. Another three years. That was nine years. So next thing, they sent us to St. Aidan's in Witness. By the time I got to St. Aidan's in Witness, I knew a lot of them, but they'd made a big mistake at the time. They put me and Franny together. And Franny was absolutely psychotic. Um, so this day was in the um, in the dining area. So we had a plan that we're going to attack them, attack the teachers. Instead of them attacking us, we're going to attack them. And how we would attack them, when you get your dinner in the evening, we're going to attack them and then we're going to smash all the windows and then we're going to go up, up the roof and then we're going to escape. So Franny, I said... Get the knives. You get them knives over there and I'll get these knives here. And then just uh, just throw the knives all right across the dining hall and just attack the two of them. So we did that. Then we ran. Ran to a pool room, smashed all the windows, jumped out, climbed up a pipe and got up the roof. And then we got down and then we and then that was our getaway down Norland's Lane. Where I used to do my paper round as yeah. a boy. <laughs> Down Norland's Lane, Norland's Lane. Yeah. And then we went over to, then we went through Hong Kong, we jumped on a train, then we headed to Liverpool. Got to Liverpool and nowhere to go, it was cold and wet. We still had the uniforms on from St. Aidan's. So there was a, in the city centre, they had an um, army and navy store. Goes in there um, and we helped ourselves. We got a pair of jeans and a jean jacket. And we're walking through the city and uh, there was a group of lads I knew from Scotland Road. And he said, all right, Terry, how are you? I said, all right, mate, how are you? Now, Franny was a very unusual kid. He wore the NHS glasses. And he looked like, you know, one of the nerds out the movies. And um, I always stuck by him with best friends. So these four guys that I'd met in the city centre, he said, Terry, what are you doing? I said, oh, we just ran away from, you know, the proof school and that. All right, well, do you want to come with us? And I went, yeah, all right. He said, but he can't come. I said, why? He said, look at them, the glasses on them. You know, that's what they do. These four fellas, um, today only one of them is alive. Only one of them. They had tragic lives. One of them is alive. His name is Joe Cavana. He's a very hard kid from Scotland Road. Very nice. I know Joe very well. And then me... Um, 
the guy that was with him was um, Joey Wright, Joe Moran, and Edgar London. And they said, come on, Teddy, we're going down the docks. We're going to do a whiskey iced. I thought, okay. No, we had nothing anyway. So we're going to go down the docks, get into the, the warehouse, get a, a big load of whiskey, and we're going to push it up Vauxhall Road <laughs> um, to Joe's house. So as we get in the warehouse, we hear all the police with the dogs, and the doors are locked. We've got the doors locked, and we're in the whiskey house. And we can't get out. Oh. We can't get out. So next thing, they've got the dogs, and we're locked in. Come out and they're screaming at us and all that, and we're shouting. So anyway, there was a ladder, and the ladder went up this window, and we went up the ladder, and there was a window. And as I looked down, it led into the Liverpool and Leeds Canal. That was the only way we could get out. So we, up, we, we got on this balcony, and we all dropped down, and we went, we dropped into a, a little, like there was a little wall, but it, it dropped into the Liverpool and Leeds Canal. So we had to swim across the canal. I was a pretty good swimmer, Joe and Egan and all. And so we all swam across. And as we got to the other side, they just jumped up and, and done one. So then me and Franny, I was looking, where's Franny? Well, his glasses had come off. Oh, oh no. And he's in the middle of the river. The, you know, the canal. So I dived in and I grabbed Franny, brought him back. And then then where did we end up? We ended up in um, Anfield Cemetery. That's where we ended up. The following morning, I went to get some bread and milk from the co-op. And the woman knew who we were. She, she'd identified us and called the police. So she was the one that he robbed yeah. going back? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Years later, she was still there. And she remembered me. What are the chances? Yeah. And she, they called the police. So they all come and were surrounded in the cemetery. So they get me and Franny and take us. Franny was taken to a, um, an isolated unit in Warrington, Newton Lee Willows, called Red Bank. And he had the experience with one of the child killers at the time that had killed two children. He was in an Excel to her. Am I allowed to say her name? Yeah, go for it. Um, it was Mary Bell. Oh. It was Mary Bell. He had the child killer. Because later on, when I seen Franny, he told me, he said, I've been in with Mary Bell. So I was sentenced to, at the time, the government to come out at the time with a short, sharp shock to shock us. So where am I going? I'm going, bump, takes me to um, Menlove Avenue. Magistrates, goes back in front of the same magistrates. They're always there at the same time. Well, Mr. Morgan, we're going to send you. We're going to shock you. You're going to detention. Gets three months in detention. Goes back. Same Black Mariah. Same cuffs on. Right to Menlove Avenue for the week. Isolated unit. Bump. Shipped right out to Derbyshire. To Foster Knoll. For the short, sharp shock. Goes in there. Spends three months in the short, sharp shock. With all it was scouts as Manchester lads. It was a barbed wire. And it was a it was like um, military exercises, all ex military. All ex military Marines and army fellas and um, you know, telling us what to do. But in it had some good stuff to it. It was like, you know, got you fit, very strong, lifting weights. You had to march two two hours a day. But it was a brutal Regiment, it wasn't there to help you. And then we worked in these cubicles where we would sand these components down for aeroplanes with sandpaper all day. And then same military exercise. So I thought after that, I'm going to get released. So when I got released from there, I was sent to back to Menlove. And I said, why am I back here? And they said, well, you're going to court. I said, why have I already been sentenced? He said, no, you're going back to court. Went back to the magistrates. I got another three years. And that was 
because sorry, I'm just going back. Um, suffering the physical mental abuse you received at the hands of the staff and inmates begins to take its toll. That was still in Falston Hall. Yeah, that was in Falston Hall. Yeah, it was taken its toll. <clears throat> and then, can I ask what the physical mental abuse you received was? Well, the physical and mental abuse was just mental abuse from um, violence, hitting us on the head, caning us. They were getting away with what they were doing. We weren't getting educated. We were under the, um, an umbrella of abuse constantly, where we were, I'd, we were, I, I would say, hyper vigilant. And and I think at the time then that the anxiety and the mental situation was setting in our brains that we were becoming unstable. I would say. And this would prove later on in life. That would come out later on in life when we were examined, actually. That came out, and I'll get to that. So I had gone back to the magistrates, and I was given another three years to go to another proof school. It was called St. Joseph's in Nantwich. And this was on the umbrella of the Christian brothers. So when I arrived, I had a confrontation with some Manchester kids because I was the only scouser in there. They fall from Manchester, and they just battered me. So I took that. I took that from them. I didn't, you know, that was it. I took them because the Manchester guy he wanted to straighten there, so I had to straighten with them and battered each other inside the home and that. And then I settled down a bit and I went, "Nah, I'm done. I'm out of it." I was, I was getting old now. I was getting older and I couldn't really take. So I, I, I just didn't belong there. So I done one. Got off, got the bus, right down from Nantwich, right on to crew, bump off to Lime Street. Got to Lime Street and I met an old friend and um, Richie Addison from Scotty Road. And we stole a car and we're going down the dock road in the car. And then a police bike comes after us. This police bike comes after us. And we're panicking that. Anyway, Richie crashes the car into a wall. And I fall out. I break my leg. And the cop is battering us, kicking us and everything. Anyway, he calls an ambulance. And I can't move. Shipped back to the hospital, one hospital. I get bandaged up, plaster, the legs. And then the three of them came from St. Joseph's to get me. Goes back to St. Joseph's. Gets put in... In my dorm, in solitary confinement for six weeks on my own. And they fed me and I couldn't walk. Not much education, just left alone with some books. So eventually I had to settle down. And um, what they did was the abuse started there again. I got put into um, a welding shop and um, I was trying to do some welding on these iron rods. And um, I'd done it wrong because I wasn't educated. I wasn't trained. And the, the guy in there who was, he was running the metal shop, he just punched me right in the jaw. And he punched me in the jaw and nearly broke my jaw. And um, nothing was done about it. I did mention, you know, I wasn't snitching or nothing like that. I just pointed it out to the headmaster. I said, you tell him, he, he, he hit me. And if he does it again, he's going to, he's, he's had it. You know, we couldn't, even though we could fight back, you know, you couldn't do that because then we would pay the consequences. They wouldn't because they were in control. That was the umbrella that we were under. So I decided to run away. Oh, and I'm off again. So I was off again and I ran away. Went and I, get, I got caught in um, Liverpool. And then they brought me into custody and then they escaped from Menlove Avenue. How did you escape? I smashed all the windows <laughs> and um, I put the sheets together and I tied down from the bed. It, see, in Menlove, you had these iron bars and we tied the sheets, me and this kid. And we smashed all the windows and then we just got down and we were gone. Boom, gone, gone. Yeah, all escaping. 
The Great Escape <laughs> from, from <laughs> Menlove Avenue. <laughs> yeah, not many kids did he. <laughs> so gets to Liverpool. What happens? Gets caught again. Gets caught again. Only one alternative. Gets caught again for shoplifting. One alternative. Borstal. Yeah. Borstal. That's the only thing. Anyway, then, before the Borstal, I'm sent, I'm, I was. I think I was the youngest kid, and there was a, um, a remand centre in Risley. I get sent to Risley. I think I was 14 and a half with all these men. I get sent to Risley, and I'm on a section. I, I, I don't I, I don't recall a section, but it was Borstal. I'm under a, a section of Borstal to be sentenced to Borstal for six months to two years. So we waited in Bor in um, in Risley. Now in Risley at the, at that time, the conditions were very appalling, absolutely appalling in the seventies, absolutely um, seventy three. So there was a guy in there on the wing, Eddie Davis from the South End, and um, he started a riot, and they got on the roof in Risley in seventy three. They get on the roof. 72, 73 it was then. They get on the roof and um, there's a big riot. So we're all banged up 23 hours a day. We can't get out. So we're waiting for the Crown to come to Crown Court to go to the Crown Court in Liverpool. And I'm with one child and he's, he's you know, we worried, I'm going to get Borstal. Everybody in the country was feared of Borstal. <laughs> You'd rather go in the army or the Marines When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and, of course, the snacks. And the energy balls are delicious. Oh, they're my favourite, the salty pistachio. Ooh. Um, wait to have this morning. Let's see what this one tastes like. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. <laughs> mmm. So what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Their bulk packaging allow them to offer their customers high quality products at a fair price. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Then Borstal. Hmm. That's what would happen. Can you explain to perhaps the American viewers what Borstal was like? Oh, to the American viewers, Borstal's like, it's not like juvenile law in America. It's an institution where you're going to get, it's like a sharp, sharp shock, but it's worse. It's actually, actually Borstal was for Britain's most toughest children. That's what it was for. And I, I would actually find that out when I got there. Because we were pretty tough at the time, street fighting. You know, because I'd been in boxing gyms with Ronnie Gibbons, who was a, he turned out a professional fighter. I'd been with Ronnie, training with him, boxing with him for years, when I, I'd see him in and out. When I ran away, I'd, we'd go to St. Saint, Saint Teresa's gym in um, Norris Green. So Borstal, to the American view, it's like a... a a very tough institution, but it's worse than juvenile all. And you're on, it's like a prison, actually. It's just the same as prison. So it came this day. We're all going to the Crown Court in Liverpool. One particular kid stuck out to me. His name is Milesy. And he was, he was petrified. So we were all, it's the Crown Court in Liverpool, it's like dungeons underneath them. And we goes up the judge and the judge is sitting there with his big red and his sash on. And, oh, you've been this and you've been that and I'm going to send you to Borstal. I'm going to give you this and this, you know, the way they do the summing up. So we were all sent to Borstal. This kid comes down, he's crying. I'm not going to be able to do it. But we didn't think about it. Because we were probably on our way to being institutionalised anyway. 
it was just another another thing that was happening in our life. That's what was happening to us. So he comes down, he's crying in the cell, and with a few other kids. So we get shipped then on a bus. Where are we going? We're going to strange ways. Notorious strange ways. In strange ways, then they had um, a wing. It's an allocation wing for Boston boys. All tough kids. So he goes in there, gets a, on this wing. Usually you're there for about three weeks to a month before you get allocated to a Boston. He goes in, and it's three to a cell, and they're preparing you for Boston. That it's, it's so regimented that the all your kits all on the beds. You can't lay on the beds. You've got to sit on the chair all day. Only at night you can remove. There's three of us in a cell, and we're getting abused by the prison guards. The screws. They start on us because we're Boston boys. We're going to give you this shock, this treatment. None of them used to say much. So the first day there, the next night, I woke up the morning and I looked at Milesy's cell and it was sealed. And I was looking at it going, why is that sealed? What's going on here? Anyway, sorry to say, he'd committed suicide. This was one of the first experiences that I'd had before I actually got to Boston. This had, this was the where the brain had just gone, the fear had gone in and said, well, you know, this was the first experience I had. And I remember that, and it stayed with me most of my life, thinking about the kid. Anyway, it was September, I remember, and we were shipped off. Shipped off to Boston. It was 72, 1972, 73, one of them years. So we get to this bull, Boston in Hull. All got off the bus. It's like a jail. Big massive prison. Tough guys. London, the Geordies, Manchester, Birmingham. A few Scousers. Goes in. Come as we get off the bus. They're giving us all the marching orders. Go this and under our breath, we're just going fuck is you know fuck off. You know, you know, you know, you know, they thought they were tough, but you know, we were tough. So then what happened was, gets in on this wing on the Borstal, settles down, settle down, you meet kids and that, you know, there's a few hard cases, there's a few f- fellas who think they're the fucking daddy and all that. This is where, where, we, where we really pick it up now, the strength. This is where we have to pick our mental strength up. Because I was born with mental strength. I had to be, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here to survive. It's in, absolutely impossible. I speak for them kids. I'll never ever, I've never ever forgot any of them. And especially Ronnie and John and Franny and Milesy and Joe Moran and all them kids that I knew in Scotland. Oh, they were good kids. It was just a way of life. So we're in Boston and we had to march every day the same thing. We're putting a, a woodwork shop we're under this micro, the micro managers do this like machines, this, do this, do this. So one instance come off the yard and it's, it's just like in, in, in scum. But I think in real life scum was, inside scum, was worse than the movie because they only portrayed so much in the movie that they couldn't show the real life in scum of the children being raped. They did show it in parts of it and things like that. And they showed one kid where he got a letter in the movie where he was, he got a letter and um, one of the teachers was reading to him and she said, oh, the letter, um, somebody had died and she thought it was the dog and it wasn't, it was his wife. He says, that's my wife. So that's how they did the movie. So my experience was, it was a brutal institution. I'd had this experience where we come off the yard, Scousers, Geordies, everyone from Manchester, all want to fight. Who's the boss? 
So this guy came off the, the yard and he was about six foot and he was looking across at me after we come marching and he went, um, you, upstairs. And then he was the daddy. He was the daddy of the postal. So these other two scousers behind me, I said to them, just hang on here, will you? So I took my coat off, goes up, and there's a thing called a recess. And uh, he was a big lad. So I just weighed into him, and he'd never experienced what you call, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Sean or Jen. It's called a Liverpool kiss. No. <laughs> a okay. bit of a Glasgow. Well, Liverpool kiss was, um, yeah, basically, it was a Liverpool kiss, but they didn't know. So it's head button. Joe Cavana, my old mate from Scotty Road, was brilliant, Harry. And I learned a lot from Joe from doing it. So we didn't realise this kid. I got him in the corner and I just head butted him and I just knocked him out. And then I got him on the floor and I battered him. I just pounded and pounded and pounded him from the boxing skills that we were trained as a young kid. Anyway, I was taken then, put into solitary confinement for one month on bread and water for four days. You got bread and water in them days. No food. Got put in for a month. Bump, I'm registered then. Violence. I've got no chance. After that, it went on for a while, but then they earned a lot of respect. They earned a lot of respect for doing that. So it sort of come like part of the daddy. So they had this big dining hall one day. And we all decided to cause a riot. And then reports, they couldn't have done that in that in the movie. Because they must have had them reports from someone in there to portray that in the movie. I've always said that. So one day we decided we were going to cause a riot with them because we were getting bullied by the screws in there. So this day we caused a riot. We got all the tables, we kicked them off, we threw all the... They were steel trays against the wall and everything. And they all couldn't put us all in the block. They all just had to separate us, calm us down. It went on for hours and hours. It was absolutely bananas, <laughs> just like the, the movie. <laughs> anyway, we, 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 we all settled down and then they just let us go quietly. We had actually won that battle and we quietly went. So it went on for... I ended up doing about eight months. I'd done about four months in the block in solitary confinement for other situations like um, the night watchman, my roommate underneath him, in my cellmate, he'd tell the night watchman to fuck off. Fuck off, you cunt. And then the night watchman would come in the next morning when he was going off his shift. He said it was him. So they marched me then back across the yard and the yard was like, it was a little block on its own, solitary confinement. And it was absolutely horrible. And inside the block, you had to walk inside the block an hour a day. And at night you had these lights on, a little light on at night. So finally, I was released from Borstal. Out back into the world. I didn't really know it at the time. Because I'd been now, phew, I was 15 going on, on to 16. Come out. And we started, the gang got back together. Me, Franny, and we brought another kid in. They'd been in approved schools too, but we were all out free. So what we started to do, we started doing snatches and night safes. I had an idea that we would start them where the money was flown in, in the area. It was good. And we just, because we, we probably couldn't function to do a job. We never had the discipline. <laughs> we would, couldn't get a job. No one would give us a job. So we just carried on. We started doing night, snatches and night safes. The first snatch we did was, um, it was a Woolworths in Broadway, where we, the manager would take the money to the bank and we'd have him on Friday afternoon and as he was taking the money he'd have it and we'd just come behind him and snatch it and then we'd just run 
and we'd run and run and run. We'd get away. We were doing them. We were doing stores. We were doing like off licenses. We were doing cinema houses in Liverpool where on a Friday night where they collected all the money, people going to cinema. And on the Monday we'd watch and then went to the bank. Do that. This particular time, I'd left Liverpool and I'd gone down to Brighton to see my brother. And I started doing some shoplifting. And I went in the shop. It was called Debenhams. They've only just closed down. <laughs> yeah, have they? Yeah. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would have closed out a long time ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> With all the um, all the shoplifting and everything. Probably. Yeah. But, no, yeah. but well, they've done well, haven't they? To it. Yeah. They've done, yeah, they've done well. <laughs> so yeah. what we did, we, we started going in Debenhams and that. And this particular Saturday, the manager came out and I had a briefcase. And he went, come here, you. And the two shirts were in the bag. And I went, I ah, get lost. And they actually took the briefcase. They took the fingerprints off it. And I'd been arrested in Brighton before. I'd been arrested before in Brighton. And I was shipped to live. I was actually in a, um, a prison called Ashford in Middlesex. Ashford. Yeah. And they'd shipped me to back to Risley. And um, this day, they got the fingerprints. So I was in Liverpool, and I'm, I'm doing the snatch that day, me and John Lally. We're doing the snatch. Anyway, we, we do the snatch, and we get 550 quid. It was quite, you know, it was a bit of money then. Goes downtown, buys some clothes, gets dressed up. Actually, um, I bought a sheepskin. Oh, nice. And... Next thing we go to a local area this this Friday night and it's um goes in having a few glasses of lager and all of a sudden I'm surrounded by four detectives and t- there was a sergeant and another police officer with him and I went, Uh oh. Do you want us for the the snatch that day? So the policeman says to me, get outside. I said, no. And I had the glass of lager and he punched me with a stick. So I threw the the glass of lager at him. I hit him on the shoulder and I ran. And I had to run around the bar and I was, but as they came behind me, they pushed me. They pushed me and my arm went through the window, this arm here. And the glass had gone right through my arm. Chopped my fingers off. My arm was hanging off here. Here. Yeah, you showed me last night. It's like a shark bite. Yeah, showed you that, didn't I? Mm. And then what happens is the artery had burst. The artery had actually burst. So I was conked out. Oh. And, the, and then the cop started kicking me. So I woke up in Walton Hospital. I just had emergency surgery to save my life. But I was, when I woke up, I was cuffed to the bed. I've just had emergency surgery to save my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm handcuffed to the bed. And I'm going, oh my God, what's going to happen here? Thinking, oh, they've got me. Now, in them days, if they did get you for that, it would have been in my circumstances. It would have been five years in detention. Because that's what they gave you. It was, de- it was called detention. I would have got five years. So this cop comes into me and he said to me, okay, we're going to be taking you to Brighton in a few days. And I looked at him. I said, what for? He said, you were shoplifting in Brighton. And that was a relief. That was a relief to me. So next thing, takes me, a few days later, takes me to the cheap side in the pool, drove down to Brighton, goes to the Brighton magistrates, remanded me in custody. I get sent to uh, a prison outside Brighton called um, Lewis, Lewis Prison. 
goes in Lewis prison on remand for the crown for two shirts two shirts so I'm in the prison and I'm doing physiotherapy on my arm doing physio and this guy is he's bringing me my breakfast and that because I couldn't couldn't do nothing with my arm I could only walk and I'm getting all this physio and I'm, the physio say, says to me how would you like the guy who's coming helping you the fella I went yeah he's all right said um said that's Gordon Goody the bank robber and I went is it I said um, oh they're my idols anyway <laughs> said I love them and it was Gordon Goody <laughs> and Gordon Goody used to come he was Irish I think he was the leader of the um, um, the great train robbery and he was dead nice. So anyway, I was waiting for the trial to come in um, Lewis Crown Court. Pleaded guilty. I thought, I might get Borstal again. I might get six months. Goes in front of the judge. Judge said, I've got your record here. You've done a bit of everything. Now you're going to be doing a little bit of this. I'm giving you two years in prison. I just looked at him and went, what could I do? Gets two years. I'm sentenced to two years in prison. Where am I going? I'm up down in, I'm down in Lewis. I get shipped out to Ashford in Middlesex to an allocation unit for one month. Goes in the office. They said to me, You're getting shipped to um, Wormwood Scrubs. You're going to be doing your sentence in Wormwood Scrubs. I was 16 years of age. Oh. By the time I'd got that two years, Sean, I'd been sentenced to nearly 17 years. Nearly 16, 16, 16 and a half years of my life it was horrendous for the kid I, I, I didn't realise till later on in life I realised anyway get shipped to Wainwood Scrubs YP Wing tough place goes in none of them had done Borstal these kids hadn't been in scum I'd asked a lot of them so there was a bit of bullying going on and I went to this Scotch fella. See these two here? See them? When we go on down for our dinner, I said, we're not going down. We're going to break the, the legs and the, the chairs in the cell. And when they come up, when they go in the cell, we're going to give it to them because they were bullying everyone. And the Scotch fella had agreed to me. So when they came up, they went in the cell and we battered the two of them. That's what you did in jail. We give it to the two of them and then we closed the door behind them. But they knew it was us. Bump, shipped down to solitary confinement and wearing with scrubs. Next thing, in them days, what they would do then, that's assault, grievous bodily harm. They bring the magistrates in to the jail and you'd be sentenced again. But the... the the governor said, I'm going to take this into my own hands. You'll lose six months remission. I lost six months. I was put in the block. And the governor came to me the next day and he said to me, the way you're going to carry on with your life, you're going to be doing a life sentence. Yeah. You're going to end up with life. If you carry on like this, you're going to end up doing a life sentence. And I always remember I said to him, I'm doing a life sentence now. That's, that's, I always remember saying that. I've done a life sentence. So he said, Terry, you need to behave, lad. And which I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to behave. So next thing, I said, listen, am I going to spend my sentence here? He went, well, we could sort something out for you. I said, I want to get moved to Walton Prison in Liverpool. My family's there. How are they going to come down and visit me? 
So anyway, I did my time in the block. I'd lost six months. So now I'm doing two and a half years. I'm doing two and a half years. So next thing, get shipped up to Liverpool a month later. Go to Liverpool. Goes into Walton Prison. There's a wing called B Wing. It's where all the YPs are. As soon as I walked in, I knew everyone all over Liverpool. I got a, a cell. My brother was actually in there as well. Yeah. And um, he got me a cell and we got in the same cell together and that. And, um, but, you know, we had a, a bit of a bad time because my father, he got sick and my father died while we were in prison. And um, we were handcuffed, me and my brother, to my mother's home. We got handcuffed together. It was the most devastating thing in life you could see. And, you know, you had these prison officers over us. And, you know, we're burying our father. And, you know, we're cuffed. Watching my dad's grave. It was absolutely devastating. But that broke your mother's heart. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. So, goes back to jail. Everything was fine in the, in, in, in Walton because we knew each other, you know. It was like, it was, a, it was a homely prison, but it was tough. I got a job in the laundry. And this is where I met some of the most no, notorious men in Britain. I, I, I had to go in the gym because my arm, and I was getting physiotherapy on my arm at the time. But I was just doing laundry. But they must have had me file and said, I think you're tagged. Watch him. Keep your eye on him. So goes in and I was doing the laundry with these fellas. But then I was going to the gym. Goes in the gym. This big fella's there, six foot four. Massive guy. We're doing circuit training every day in Walton. This massive guy. I think he was on category A. At the time, he comes in with these screws. He must have been, because he was guarded everywhere. It was Paul Sykes. <laughs> it was Paul. So I got to know Paul. And he was he was all right, like. And just got to know him in the jail and that, you know, every day going and then. I always remember this day, he was arguing with the screws. And he picks the weights up. He throws them right across the gym, about 400 pounds. They go right across the floor. Absolutely bananas. I'll fucking do the lot of years and all that. So about eight screws came in, took him back to his cell. And I was just looking at him like that. Fucking nutter. So it took eight screws to get him down. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> Paul was a big guy. He was a boxer. Yeah. Yeah, he was but he was all right. And I, I don't know what things have been said about him in the past. But to me, he was, not, he, was, he was all right. So I carried on in my life in there. He put a guy in a coma for a month, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's when he was boxing. Yeah. That's when he was boxing then, Sean. Oh, yeah, wow. when he turned professional. Mm -hmm. But he was too old then. Mm -hmm. He actually come to Liverpool when, I'm, when I got out. Went to see, I went to see John Conti fight. John Conti fought at the stadium. And I went to see him. And he come home and he said hello to me. And they're all looking at me like that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, I'd, I'd done my time in Walton, but I had, a, I had another bad situation in Walton with a prison officer. Early in the morning, we were giving the water to the prisoners, so we were let out early. But for some reason, this officer, this screw, he didn't like me, and he decided not to open me up this day. So when I come out, we got a little bit angry for not getting opened up. And... Um, he went, fuck you and all that. I'm not opening you. You shouldn't be given. You should be locked up away. So I got the, um, as I come out, went to slop out. I got me, me bucket and I fucking lashed it over him. And it went all over him. The shit and the piss went all over him. And he, he, he was in the army, this fella. And he was running down the stairs. He was shitting himself. <laughs> I said, now go on, fuck off. And um, next thing, about 10 of them got me, come up. He got me, bump, straight in the block. Right in the block. Yeah, 
Um, we got done for assault, lost 30 days remission, spent 30 days in the block. Yeah. Then um, my time came, got on with it, just carried on Liverpool, finally released. So eventually I come out, I come out of Walton. I always remember the date was, it was March the 8th, 1974. And I'm walking down the street and it was raining. And I've got the shirt on that I robbed in Brighton. I've got the shirt on my back. <laughs> I've got this yellow Ben Sherman on. Anyway, I get home to my mother's house. And um, unfortunately, she became sick at the time. And she wasn't well. And my other brother was there, Alan. I was very close with Alan. And he said to me, <clears throat> he said, Terry, I'm taking you to Southampton. I've got a friend. He's going to get you on the Queen Elizabeth II, the ocean liner. And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, stayed home for a few weeks and that. And um, eventually... I was taken down to Southampton, taken to me. Alan had been in the Merchant Navy, my brother. He'd done the, um, the Maiden Voyage on the QE2, Alan. And uh, he was a lovely lad. And he was looking out for me. And I think he had a bit of, you know, things in his head because when I ran away from the homes, he took me back and he didn't realise at the time what was happening. So he, 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 he felt like he had to do something for me and he was. And he would have done it anyway if he, if he wouldn't have done that anyway. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day, I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon, company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier. Formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. So he goes, goes down to Southampton and he said, you're going to stay with my mate. He's got a flat in Southampton. So I went down, we stayed, we had a little drink. I didn't drink that much. And that, you know, being in, locked up most of my life that age, and, and the physical training that we'd done. Goes to Southampton and um, meets a fella called John Callow in Southampton. And he said to me, Terry, I'm going to get you on the QE2. You're going to be a specialist cook. Cook. In America, it's cook. <laughs> I'm gonna, you're going to be a specialist cook on the Queen Elizabeth II. You've got to go over to Cunard. I know this guy in Cunard. <clears throat> He's going to get you a discharge book. He's going to get you a seaman's book. He's going to get all your photographs done. And you're going to be a chef on the QE2. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm made up. <laughs> but also, I've got no experience. So this is, the, this is another challenge I've got to face in my life. I've just gone through all that in my life. Short, sharp, shock, Boston, 12 years of proof schools. And I'm going on the QE2 as a professional man in the outside world to be trained as a specialist cook. It takes years for the specialist cook to be trained. And I'm just walking on the ship and I'm going to be a specialist cook. So that was another challenge for me in the real world of life. So it goes down and this morning I'm going on to the QE2. I just looked at it. What a ship. It was beautiful. Goes on, signs on at the purser's office, does everything. They give me my uniforms and they take me upstairs to the kitchen and the ship is sailing to New York. It's doing the transatlantic, goes upstairs, doing the kitchen. 
and there's a thing called chain and potatoes. You have to like in there, it's a, a, an English style where very fancy potatoes. You have to turn it and the peel, and then you have to roast them. And I couldn't do it, so I was I was fucking all up. I was fucking all the potatoes up. <laughs> so next thing, this this chef said, "Fucking get him out of here! I don't want him in here." I don't want him on my fucking corner. And I'm going, oh, my God. I was fucking slapping in a minute, a little so-and-so. But, you know, anyway, I left it. Then I got moved in. And an old friend of mine, I'll give him a shout out now, Tony Lawless, lovely man. He came to me rescue. And he went, what's all the commotion about? And he said, are you from Liverpool? I went, yeah. He went, get over here with me. That's what the Scousers do. <laughs> so I got over with Tony, my old mate. Oh, and um, I started doing sandwiches with him and cooking soup, boiling soup and that, and I helped him. So when I, I stayed in the kitchen, we, we'd stop in New York. Now, my mate, Ronnie Gibbons, he went to New York to be a professional fighter. And I was telling all my mates on the ship that I knew him, you know. I said to Tony, we, we, we've got to go and see Ronnie. He's turned professional. And he was under a guy called Gil Clancy. And he was at Gleason's gym in Manhattan. I couldn't wait to get off the ship in New York. So we get to New York after five days. Goes up to Gleason's gym in um, Manhattan. Goes up there. Walks up these stairs. And um, Gil Clancy's in the gym. And he goes, yeah, can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for Ronnie Gibbons. And he went, yeah, he'll be in in a minute. So Ronnie comes in, just walks in. I went, all right, lads, how are you? He went, oh, my God. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm on the QE2. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yeah. So next thing, he's, I, I stayed with him like for about four hours. He, he had four sparring partners. He said, Teddy, I'm going to be welterweight champion of the world. That's what he said to me. He did make it to number one in the world. He did actually make it. So anyway, here's the two of us. All little kids when we were eight. We're 18, 19 now. In New York, walking down 42nd Street. From Liverpool to New York, walking down 42nd Street together. Anyway, she had anything going on on the QB2? I said, oh, I don't know yet. I don't know what's going on. So we, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next month. I go back on the QB2. Stayed with the kitchen. This guy came to me and he said to me, why don't you become a waiter? You know, there's more money, you can make tips and that. So I said, all right. So I went down to the office and I put a request in to, do, um, to be a waiter. <clears throat> so I put that request in. And I became a waiter. Went up what you call um, topside. Started out first at um, washing glasses, cleaning the glasses. They had to be spec spotless in first class for all the customers and um, a lot of stars were going on there at the time anyway I got better at that and I got this job as a, a first class waiter saving cocktails and I ran the old the whole restaurant and I was making a fortune so I thought of a way out to make more money and you know, with the Americans, you know, sometimes they wanted a large vodka. That means two, but I'd give them one and charge them two. And we started making a fortune on the ship. <laughs> and things were getting great. So we got to Southampton. And we were getting signing off the ship for a, a month. You do three months on and three months off. And what I noticed in the corner was the wages there was two suitcases and it was just full of £10 notes like this and £20 and it was incredible. I just looked at it, I took one look and I went, oh my God, I'm having that. That's the first thing I thought of. There must have been thousands and that because there was 1,800 staff on the ship. They had to pay out. So we waited for the purses after the done the payout and I followed them back to Cunard that's where they came from 
Anyway, gets off the ship and I thought, go to Liverpool. I know a few fine crime families in the South End I've been in Borstal with, been in jail with. And I went to two particular ones, very well known they are, in, in, the, in the area of Liverpool. I had cases, done a lot of violence, and they knew me. And I said to them, do you want to come down to Southampton? And when these fellas, the purses are taking the money, the takings onto the QE2, I said, just have it off them. I said, I'll, I'll drive or I can take it because I've done the snatches and night safes and we were experts at that. So I said, I'll drive. And anyway, they said, okay, we'll come down to Southampton. Anyway, they didn't show up and I was very disappointed at them. So I left it. Goes back on the QE2 and started carrying on. So we'd done a whale cruise, finished the whale cruise, a lot of stars on there. So this day goes back on a signs on. And this guy said to me, Oh, there's a, a person upstairs in the penthouses. Um, they haven't showed up. Do you want to be the butler? And I went, Yeah, okay. I'll be the butler. And it, the service was no difference. It's all silver service. And it's the personality. And it's just the way it was. So we said, okay. So I went up to the penthouses. And I started working in the penthouses. We had two floors. And then we, down below we had the Queen's Grill. It was the best service in the world you've ever seen. Anyway, he was coming on. He was coming on the ship. Elizabeth Taylor. Oh. And Richard Burton. They're coming on the ship and they've been on a, a lot before I heard. So took care of them a few times. And one I always remember one night. She she's had a few drinks, Elizabeth. And um she said, Teddy, can I get another drink, please? And I went, Yeah, sure. Gets the drink, goes to the room, and she was she was a beautiful woman. And I looked at her, and you know, as you see beauty when you're traveling with, around the world, you see different cultures and you see different people. And I seen this woman and looked at her. I always remember our Liverpool sense of humor. And I, get, I knocked on the door and I gave her the drink. And Richard was downstairs and he was gambling because they had a casino on there. And I, I looked at her and I just looked at her and I went, I wish you were 19. <laughs> And she looked at me and smiled. And I went, good night. And she went, good night. <laughs> and I had a look like a bit of a friendship with her. So but you that, actually flirted with Elizabeth Taylor? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? What's wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with that. I think every man on the planet would worry. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I, I honestly think if she would have been 19, I think she would have flirted with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think she, I think she would have liked to. Yeah. yeah. So... But then, you know, with the um, the mind of a criminal, there was things going through my mind that I didn't like. And one of the things that I came up was to to steal Elizabeth Taylor's diamonds. And one particular diamond was the in the ring that Richard bought for eight million. And it was easy. It was in the room. It was so fascinating. So I thought I'd had it in the back of my mind. So on the ship, we have this thing called the pig with all the staff drinking the pig. So I went down there one night and I walks in. I was on my own. Took my uniform off, put a white shirt on, a grey pair of pants. And I walked in, there was a girl sitting at the bar. And I took a look at her. So she's nice. And she's sitting by herself. And I went over and said, all right, love, how are you? Do you want a drink? She went, yeah, I'll have a drink. I said, what do you do? She said, oh, she was from London. She said, I'm the manager of the, the jeweler store. I said, are you? She went, yeah. She said, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm in the penthouses. And sometimes I'm topside. And I said... I said, are you the manager of the store where, they, where all the shops are? She went, yeah. So I said, all right. So I had a few drinks with her. She was absolutely gorgeous. 
really beautiful woman. And um, she was only 19. I said, do you want to come out with me tomorrow in New York? I'll take you out for dinner. She said, yeah. So I took out for dinner. Not we ever became of it, we were just friends. So one night I said to her, do you want to come and have a drink with me? And she went, no, I can't. I'm doing the inventory. I said, what inventory? She went for the jewellers. So my head starts going again. Hang on, the inventory for the jewellers? <laughs> now you're talking about high class in these days. Very high class. So she told me, I said, well, let me bring a beer up to you and we can have a, a drink together in the jewellers. So it goes up. Goes up there. And she said, oh, we're putting all new displays in. And she's doing the inventory. And I'm looking at the inventory. I said, how much is here? And she went, about five and a half million. She said, we're going to be putting the displays out and we're going to be putting the diamonds and on display. It's a new thing. And I went, oh my God. I'm going to have the lot of it. That's the first thing I thought of. Who, who, who am I going to do it with? Soon as the ship docks in New York, right up to see Ronnie Gibbons. I know Ronnie. He's the main man. Shoots up there. Ronnie, he's training her on Wait for me, Terry. Same old dance. Comes down. Said, listen, I've got two things here, lad. Let's go and have a beer. No, he didn't drink and I, he just drank water and I had a beer. And then we're sitting in the dining room on 42nd Street. And um, they'd just done the movie Taxi Driver. And I'd gone past that and I was watching them do that movie. And um, I said, listen, lad, I said, um, what do you fancy on this, lad? Get on the ship. I said, there's about five million on, on, in, the, um, in the display cases. I said, oh, you can have Elizabeth Taylor's jewellers. I said, but you know what? Elizabeth Taylor's a lovely woman, you know, wouldn't like to really steal off her. It was sort of setting in then. I thought that, you know, my life was getting a bit more better and I was doing well. So our goal was to do the jewellers. So being on the ship a while and I was doing well, I was making a lot of money, coming home, was going to buy a house in Liverpool and I'd met my future wife, which was Annette and she was my lovely sweetheart. Got engaged to her and I went back to the QE2. And um, still had lots of friends on the QE2. And so the plan was we're going to do the jewellers. There was five million on display in the middle of the night when it was docked in New York. When everyone was asleep, we were going to use a fire hydrant on the ship. Me and Ronnie would have masks on together. And then we had gloves and then he would put all the diamonds into a bag. And then we had my room where I would we'd go to. We had different levels of the ship. We were on the bottom of the ship. That was our accommodation. That's what we would do. All of a sudden, I bring Ronnie on the ship. And I, I look behind me and we're getting followed. And then these two guys said, excuse me. And I went, yeah. He went, um, we know you. Who's this guy? I said, he's my friend. He's just coming on for some lunch. No, you're not. You, off the ship. So I walked down with him. They took him off the ship. And they said to me, when we get back to Southampton, we need to speak to you. So I just carried on with my work. Guess to Southampton in the morning. We dock at seven o'clock from Transatlantic. Four busies. I knew they were busies. I knew they were coppers, detectives and that. But I didn't know which squad they were from. Takes me, takes me in a car, takes me to the Cunard building, sits down with me and he said to me, um, you're a member of the Irish Republican Army. 
And I went, what? I said, no. Oh, yes. You've been drinking with the Irish Republican Army. Do you drink with Irish men on the ship? I went, yeah. I said, I have a drink with them. So at the time, the Irish Republican Army were going to blow the QE2 up to smithereens. And what it was, I was drinking with a couple of them. Oh, so they had done a check on the ship of all our criminal records and bump targeted me. Oh, no. So I got sacked. They found enough gelanite in Southampton to blow the whole ship up. They got two of the guys that I was drinking with. I think they got 15 to 20 years. I don't know where the tip came from. So next thing I got sacked. Where am I again? I'm back onto the streets of Liverpool. I'm back on the streets. I go home. Just had a lovely life on the on the Queen Elizabeth II for a few years. Bought a nice car. I was going to buy it home. So I decided to get married. I got married. And I had a big, like, um, a massive wedding with the money I'd saved off the QE2. I was making thousands, thousands on the side. And I got married. And it was... It was in the Aiton Suites. It cost me a fortune. Oh, I was like 400 people at the wedding. And it was like, um, if you looked at, if you looked at the Godfather's wedding and you looked at my wedding today, it was similar. It was actually similar. Because people look at my wedding albums now and they say, this is like the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a blue suit on. Velvet suit. Look at you. Look at this. 400 people, big party. After the wedding, I was on my own. So I drove down to my mother's house and I passed a, a bus stop. And there was a guy at a bus stop. So I pulled the car around and he was a bit of a hard lad, this kid. Very tough guy. I don't know if you heard of item baddies. In, in a, there's an area, suburban Liverpool called Heighton. Heighton? Heighton, yes, yeah. next to Witness. Cr yeah. Witness, Cranton, Heighton. Okay, yeah. All yeah. right. So there's some hard kids in Heighton, really hard, oh, yeah. hard, tough guys. It was very renowned in, in England, and he was one of them. So I pulled the car up and went, All right, lads, where are you going? He said, um, oh, I'm just going to do something. And he knew me very well that he could trust me. So he said to me, can you give us a... He said, I'm waiting for the bus. I'm waiting ages here for the bus, the 60 bus, to going to Bootle from Queen's Drive. So I said, yeah, get in. So he goes, yeah, I said, he said, I'm not sound, you know what, I might bend you in on this. And I went, what is it? And he sort of wouldn't tell me. He said, go on. He said, well, I'm going to the gyro in Bootle. Now, the gyro is the biggest place in Liverpool where it dis distributes all the money to the post offices in the whole of Liverpool. And I'm going, all right. So he said to me, will you meet me here tomorrow? He tells me that and then it's in my head. It's gone right in my head. I meet him the next day and he sits down, he said, um, he's with another guy. And then she said to me, this guy, he said, this is Jacko Fitzpatrick. He's from Cantrell Farm, next to Aiton. And I said to him, I've got just got a flat in Cantrell Farm off um, the government. I'm moving there. And he went, are you? He said, yeah, well, he said, I'll be in the Black Horse. I said, okay, I'll see you in there. But he was older than me, a lot older. And he'd done the approved schools and everything. But I'd heard that he was one of the greatest bank robbers in the northwest of England. This is how I, I start my life with him. And he said to me, Terry, are you sure you want to get into this? And I went, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. 
because I was in fear of no one. I could fight. And the only thing to me was not carrying any guns. I was a little bit against that because I had the power to take anyone down or any security men, anyone. We had that power. And I would always be the leader. So this particular day, Jack would spoke to me. He was in another pub and he said, I'll tell you confidentially. He said, but I, Jack, in a van in Cantrell Farm. It's the first stop. It'll be 65,000. We reckon 65,000 to 100 grand. He said, Teddy, do you want to drive the car? I said, well, to be honest with you, I've been to the gyro and I've done my own surveillance and I'm going to be doing what you're doing. So I said to him, I've been following a van and it's going to Outer Bootle into Sefton and it does 11 drops. So I worked it out for three months. The 11 drops would be about a quarter of a million pounds at the time. So I went out. I picked a guy from, um, one of the toughest guys from Kirby in Liverpool. And then I picked my old partner, John Lally, because I'd been done so many things with John. And I picked another guy who was a bit of a tough guy, but really, he was a shit house. When it comes to it, he was going to be the second driver. The first driver I had was a, a guy called Paul Williams. Was one of he could have been a racing driver. This guy, he learned us how to steal cars, and we had a group called the Hell and the VH drivers, the Vic Hell drivers. In between Norris Green and Walton, and we'd rob all the you know, the Capris, the Cortinas, and everything that we'd rally with them. We'd get the MGBs the, and that, and we'd have the police chase us. And we'd always get away. And Paul was the best. So he would be on the first driver. My second driver was Frank Glass. He's a tough guy. So we thought he was. And heavy man from Kirby and me and John. I was the main man. This was set up for three months. We would strike on... It was a bank holiday at the end of April that the following weekend, the following weekend it was a bank holiday, so that there would be two loads of money. And we would strike at nine o'clock. It was all set up. I'd taken them there. I got the safe house ready. I had the safe house ready from another tough guy that I was in Borstal with. It was all taken, but nobody knew where I was going. I would be the main man to carry if any trouble started. I would give them the directions what to do, where we're going, and what we're going to do to hijack it. So in Los Angeles, there was a movie called Heat. Brilliant. One of the greatest uh, I've ever seen. Now they are actors. In life, when you've done something like this, what we were going to do, I don't know where it comes from and who we are, and why we're doing it. But it takes something, some men to do it, and especially to do this. I'd always remembered about the great train robbery, which probably was easy to stop a train and just get some mailbags. The whole objective of doing a, ro a robbery is to get away. It is one of the most significant things is to do is to get away. And then the men that you're doing it with is that you don't leave any forensic and then you don't leave any of this. No grassing. So we're all set. The night before, they'd already had the directions what to do. The night before, we'd had a few drinks. That following morning from the nervous system, I was being sick from nerves because it was it, it was a heavy job now in 1969 
there was a job done in in um, Liverpool. Um, it was called the Water Street Bank. And my friend had done that Water Street Bank. His name was Tommy Comerford, who had got to know very well. And then also there was another gang from Heighton. When I was doing physiotherapy in Walton, a guy called Tommy Smith, and they hijacked a, a sorting office in um, Worcestershire. And, but the police were waiting for them. They got a tip off. And Tommy got shot in the arm. And Tommy Comerford would give a, a, a cigarette light, lighter to a lawyer. And the cops seen it. And they caught Tommy. And Tommy got 10 years. So I knew that we would be... We were, if we were caught, we would get a long sentence. But we didn't care. And also, I was married. And I, d I don't know why, but we, we set out to do it. It was all set that morning. No one knew what I was carrying. I never told anyone. The van pulls up. The car's supposed to pull up beside the van. All the windows are down on the van. John would get the guy on the floor, in the back, put all the bags into the down windows, into the back of the truck, the, the car, the stolen car. Paul pulls up. I'm watching. They're too slow. John doesn't make it. The guy gets out. He's got one bag. As he's taking it in, there's a guy standing on the door. What does he do? He doesn't go for the bag. He punches him with a heavy punch. The post office guy who's carrying the bag flies through the window. Smashes right through it. The plate glass window, as big as this wall, he goes through the window, he's cut to pieces. Now, there's a line, a queue, all getting the pensions, because it's double money. There's a milk float in the corner here. This goes off, and I'm going, Oh my God, he hasn't got, he hasn't got the bag. The guy would not let go of the bag. So I ran from behind a tree. We're all, we've got the masks on. We're all in black. I go over and I grab the guy. He's cut to pieces. And he won't let go of the bag. So I had a rifle down one part of my body here that was loaded. And on this side, I had a claw hammer. So I said, let go, and he wouldn't let go. So what I decided to do was take the claw hammer out and just threaten him. I didn't want to hit him. And I was so shocked what's going on. We had to follow through. They were at my orders. I get the bag. It's a big bag. It's, it's, there's a significant amount of money in there that we'll never get. But it's all gone wrong. Absolutely gone wrong. Paul's in the car. A guy comes behind the car and whams us in. And we can't get out. We're stuck. Imagine this. All the people that are getting the money run to the milk float. They get the bottles of milk and they start throwing them at us in the car we cannot get out the car I get out I go around Paul get out drags him out get in the back get in the back so I did the the Vic Hell Drive movement the Hell Driver Vic Hell Drivers put the car into reverse Put the clutch very low. Let it out a little bit. Vroom. Boom. Push them off us. Push them off us. I got the car out. Next thing, all the bottles, as we were getting into the car, were smashing all over us. We had glass and milk all on our heads, all over our bodies. And as we got in the car, the glass and the milk was all in the car. But we got the bag. I'd actually got the bag. 
And one of the things is I was going to pull the rifle out and I was going to shoot it at the, the bystanders in the air to back off us. But I'd, I didn't have to use it. I left it. We get off. Now we've got to get to the second car. They press the screamer off on what did you they carry a screamer with them as the one man will stand he has a screamer it's called a black box screamer when that goes off it's like an alarm but it screams crazy to scare you away that was going off the alarm was going off in the post office and we could hear the police sirens coming And I went, oh my God, this has all gone wrong. We get to the second getaway car. It was in a construction zone. I get there. I see a taxi. It's not the guy's car, the stolen car that he should have got the night before. It's his own taxi. And I'm going, what the fuck is he doing? And I look to the right and there's a little kid mixing cement. And of all the commotion that morning, the kids are mixing the cement and he sees these guys all in black with masks on getting in the taxi. What does he do? He takes the taxi number. Of course. He took the taxi number. So I told the taxi driver, Frank, go home, lad. You're going to get it. Just say you picked us up as a fair. Dropped me and John at the safe house. The other two went. Boom. I get in the safe house. Takes all my clothes off. It was all organised. In plastic bags. Got to be burnt. New set of clothes. Got the bag. Got the bag on there. Could still hear the police sirens. John's quiet. John was a quiet lad. He didn't say nothing. I'd done most of the work. Anyway, we sit down, we're having a cup of tea, calming down. We had new clothes on. And my plan now was the taxi driver's going to get caught. We're going to get it. So my plan was to go to the East End of London. I'd been in London with a few gangsters in Barking Road in Cannon Town. And I'd worked with a few of them. And I'd met them on the QE2. So anyway... I opened the, the bag as a seal on it. It has a silver steel. It's a seal on it. And on that seal, it says how much money's in there. How many £20 notes? How many £10 notes? How many £5 notes? And there was 33000 in it. And I thought, that's not bad, but, you know, we should have... Imagine what was left in the bag. Imagine what was left in there. So I said to John, listen, I'm going to leave the money in here. We're not paying no one until we see who gets arrested. So the guy's house that we're in, in the, in, in the um, safe house, he goes out that day and he gets the, the Liverpool Echo. Here we are. We've made the headlines of the whole of the Liverpool Echo. The biggest headlines. One of the biggest robberies that would ever happen in Liverpool. And um, I was like, oh, my God. I didn't realise. So that night, when it went dark, I had a car delivered to the house and I drove to London. Stayed in London, but I'd, I'd had some connection with some solicitors at the time that I knew were bent, that I could talk to. And I phoned a guy. And I said, all right, how are you doing? All right, good. Did you get on that today? Yeah, I did. Okay, what's the outcome? It's you. I said, really? It's me? He went, yeah. It's you. I said, okay, I'll see you. So I was stuck in London. So the big, big shots... In the, in, the, in the the serious crime squad all over the city, from police station to police station, 
at on me with Izzy and John like John's just quiet said John they're going to be on us so I had no alternative to return back to Liverpool gets back to Liverpool goes in a bar and this big tough guy comes over to me and he said to me all right and I looked at him and I went all right he went saying where's Frank's money and I looked at him and went you talking to me he went I'm talking to you I said I don't know you now fuck off well I said I've just told you mate fuck off don't know you and he starts mounting off and I said hey lad go away so I knew Frank had gassed us up I know he'd put us in it he'd fucking really put us in it so someone had got I'd had a party in Liverpool after the wedding and someone knew where I was where I lived no one knew where I lived that morning I came out three weeks later I'm surrounded by about 20 police officers got me against the wall never said nothing to me never read no Romanda rights no rights put your hands behind the back you're under arrest I know they were loaded with guns at the time I knew they had gloves on and everything 20 of them came that morning they got me <clears throat> takes me into custody my I've never said a word in my life in custody and anyway basically I was under investigation under anyway they said to me you're going on an identification parade so I said okay they'd picked a, a, an old lady who was 65 years of age she had thick glasses And she picked me out. That was enough for them to charge me. They charged me robbery with force with a hammer. And the headlines was Wade on the post office, hammer gang. And how it was structured in the news about the milk and the glass and the blood. And I write that chapter in my book. The glass, the milk, and the blood. I've wrote that. So it goes into this, it goes back to Risley, where I'd been as a kid. And now I'm, I'm, I think I'm 22, 23. I think it was 23, 22. And I'm in Risley, and it's infested with all the gangsters. And I'm walking around the yard. And who's in there? Tommy Cummer, Tommy Cummerford. And he comes behind me and it's all in the news. There wasn't many bank robbers in there at the time. It was mostly for importation. I did not know much about importation until later on in life. So next thing, this he comes behind me, Tommy, and he goes, um, all right, lad. You're the new bank robber on the, the block, are you? I just looked at him. Anyway, he goes to court. I went to court. And um, he come back to me and he went, how are you doing and that? And he said, I was involved in the Water Street Bank in 1969 and I got 10 years. And he was asking me about the case. I said, I don't know much about it, you know. I said, I wasn't there. I said, I'm, I was in bed. <laughs> I don't know fuck all about it. I was in bed. And they were all in there then. Um, Charlie Seeger was in there. John Haas, um, and the Bennett South End. I got to know some of them. I just sat with some of them and that, you know. John Haas was the guy who did. John was quite big. He had the big security where they'd done something. They got 18 years and the MPs let him out. And um, Charlie Seeger was a, um, a good friend of mine, best friend who had met Charlie a few times. And he'd been involved in a murder. And he wrote a book, Killer with um, one of, I think it was Ronnie Cray's ex-wives. Um, he was involved with one of them. So I had new Charlie, and all my friends knew Charlie. So anyway, I'm in Risley, 
And a, a friend of mine came up to me after about four months. It was John Conti's brother, Jerry. Jerry being arrested for um, travellers' checks, three million on the docks. And he came up to me one morning and he said to me, Jerry, you've got bail. I put a bail hearing in um, to the um, the Crown in London where the three judges listened to it at the Old Bailey. And he said, you've got bail. I went down to the PO's office. They come out and they said to me, yeah, you've got bail. Next thing, bump, walks out of Risley after six months. The judge had said to them in the court, why is this man being arrested? It wasn't because of Frank Glass. His evidence is admissible against the co-accused. He said, how is this man being arrested? He said, I've read the reports. The post office men said that they were attacked. I'd mash some. Why would a woman pick me out? So anyway, the trial's going to start. This big trial's going to start. So I've got a, um, got a QC from Manchester. He was a judge called David Brown. Then I had um, a guy called Turner. He worked on the Bulger case. He was defence for the in, in the Bulger murder. He did the, the kids, John Venables and the other kid, when they killed um, Jamie Bulger. David Turner was the defence attorney for them. And at the time, he was a junior barrister for me. So what they told me, the trial was going to start and I'd met them, my solicitor. My solicitor at the time was um, Rob Brody, who was very known in the city. And he told me, he said, you know, just listen to your barristers. So the barrister said, yeah, you've got 50-50. And I said, well, what's the other 50? Or 50 get off, what's the other 50? He said, 10 years. Ten years. And I said, okay. So the trial's going to start three weeks before Christmas. So what I did, I wore a blue suit, a shirt and a nice tie. Got my hair all cut off and I had a razor part here. Goes in to, with my wife into the, the crown court. My barrister comes out, sees me, he's like, oh my God, the gallery's full. The court's full. Watching, going to watch the trial. He goes back in the court. So I looks over and I've seen all the coppers. They were down the end of the court. And here's the witness sitting by herself. And I looked at her and I went over to her and I said to her, how are you doing, Mrs. Sino? My name's Detective Sergeant Smith. I met you at the police station. Do you remember me? Oh, yes, she said. I remember you. I said, everything's going to be fine today. And I walked away. <laughs> so next thing, the trial starts. The trial starts. Next thing, the lawyers get up to give the peace. I this queen counsel. I'm going to prove today that Mr. Mogan did the robbery. He's the hammer man. He's done numerous robberies in this city. He threw that into the jury, which is, should have been a well, that's, you can't do that. The judge just looked at him. That's how bad he wanted me. So my lawyer stands up and he goes, QC Brown, he says, Mr. Mugan, I want you to go into the box. Your name is Mr. Mugan, is that correct? I said, yes. The jury is there. The gallery's full. I'm, I'm just standing there. Your Honour, we're going to call the witness. Yes. The judge's name was QC Temple. He was the one that gave me the bail. He actually came from London, particularly for this case. It was a sign to him that he wanted it. For some reason, I'm in the box in the crown. I'm standing there. 
my lawyer says to the witness, can you state your name? She gives a name. He looks at her and he says, I want you to name that man that's in the box. She looks and she goes, yeah, that's Detective Sergeant Smith. <laughs> <laughs> the judge went like that with his glasses. He said, I'll give you one more question. He turns around and he says to her, was you shown any photographs in the police station? Oh, yes. <laughs> Was it Mr. Mugen? She went, oh, yes. The judge just went like that. Took his glasses off. Rubbed his eye. <laughs> he went, I've heard enough. I'm stopping the trial. I'm stopping the trial. They came back, sent the jury out. Came back in. Clerk of the court got up. Judge told him, I want you to find Mr. Mugen not guilty. Wow. I get a not guilty. Wow. How'd that feel? I walked out the court. I was congratulated by the jury and all the people in the gallery. Terry, well done. <laughs> and I went, fucking well done. <laughs> I went, I haven't done nothing. Frank Glass would be sentenced to three years of probation for being a, a police informer. He told them everything. But his evidence couldn't go against mine. However, when I walked out of that courtroom, I was a wanted man. Mm. I was one of the most wanted men in Liverpool at the time. I was put on a 24-hour surveillance by a serious crime squad from London and Liverpool, and I didn't know. I did not know. And then it starts again. It's gonna all start again. Oh, God. And you're gonna have to wait for part two of this series to hear what happens next, because it's gonna get even more mental. So if you've enjoyed this, please let us know in the comments what you think and terry like like we said earlier do you want to lift that up jen the, the banner oh, cool. yeah we are gonna be you know terry's gonna be keeping us updated on when his book's coming out do you want people to go over to your instagram or anything like that yeah actually it's called the hollywood butler <laughs> I like. and don't forget our sponsor coro as well link is in the description box five percent off Code true crime, yeah. The Thank Hollywood you. Butler. Hollywood, the Hollywood Butler. Butler. The Instagram. Hollywood I mean, Butler. I love that photo of you. You look very... It's all fashion. black and white, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man, give us a hug, brother. <laughs> what a journey. Right, round two. Yeah. What a journey. Well done. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, being an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialized with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honor. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. 
Chet Sandu's book is finally available worldwide on Amazon. He's one of our most viral podcast guests ever. The book is called Self Made, Juice Paid, an Asian kid who became an international drug smuggling gangster. Do you want to read some of the back, Jen? Yeah, go the blurb. In 1999, Chet Sandu was arrested at gunpoint in Alicante Airport for smuggling the largest quantity of illicit pharmaceutical drugs in Spanish history. Interesting. Overnight, he went from living in the shadows of the Costa del Crimes underworld to being labelled a notorious supervillain in the international press. Incarcerated alongside murderers, rapists, and terrorists in a super maximum security wing. He had to navigate a world of murderous knife fights, prison breaks, drug taking, and high stake power plays. Good bedtime read. In Self Made Jews Paid, learn how a British born Asian kid with disabilities raised in a corner shop emerged as a protector of his family from racist thieves and hooligans. Be prepared to be entertained, informed and offended by Chet's no-holes-barred account of raves, drugs, bodybuilding, entering the fashion industry. Did you know that he dated Kylie Minogue and Naomi yes. Campbell? <laughs> latest interview. Working the doors and life in one of the world's deadliest places to be incarcerated. If you enjoyed Chet's podcast series with us, there's a lot more detail in the book. Check it out. Worldwide on Amazon, ebook, paperback, and audiobook.